Hello, everyone, and welcome to the annual Avocado Gamescast Halloween Spooktacular. Today, we're discussing the spookiest subject of all, alternate realities. Whoosh. I need some coast-to-coast -coast FM music. Oh, yeah, for sure. So what are some examples of alternate realities? Well, what if Sega still made consoles? What if Xbox had gone in on brute force instead of Halo? What if Randy Pitchford were actually a good person? Well, before we contemplate that, let's introduce ourselves. My name's Merv, and joining me this week, he wears a skeleton on the outside. It's Otaku no Mike. Don't knock it till you try it. I will not. He's the one who left that stain. It's Ben. I'm frantically Googling what the fuck brute force is so I can be ready for this conversation. <laughs> uh, should be good. And finally, he's three spoopy five me. It's the Kappa. What's up, guys? So, how are y'all doing? Good. Actually, get ready to leave for Universal Studios here uh, tonight. Uh, we're going to leave at like two in the morning, so it should be a fun drive with a six-year-old and a two-year-old in a oh, car. <laughs> So Universal are the people who do the, the Dark Universe, or did? Oh, yeah. They, um, they tried. They tried their best. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my understanding is that, kind of tying into the theme of this podcast, you are working on a podcast of your own related to the Dark Universe oh, Cinematic Universe. Yeah, or the I got a lot, of, a lot more work to do with that one before it's ready for prime time. I, I didn't realize that people were going to get as into the... Uh, the what ifs of making a successful franchise. So I've got to kind of take that one back to the drawing board, but to be determined, I still want to do it. It sounds fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see where you take the Dooku. Although I think um, to speak about the website, the avocado uh, where we all hang out, um, I think they've sort of taken that creative energy and channeled it into a very real sitcom called dad's Casa. Oh yeah. So <laughs> stealing all my, my, the creatives right now yeah apparently instead of coming up with cool movie ideas we're just coming up with shitty sitcom ideas <laughs> <laughs> which i am I on board with really what we're more equipped for <laughs> um so speaking of things that are shitty um speaking of things that are shitty blizzard entertainment uh this past weekend as of our recording they did something that has caused there's the burp um, it's caused a monumental <laughs> amount of controversy in not just the gaming sphere, but the wider like news. And U.S. senators are tweeting about this now, which is wild. Um, so just to give a recap of what happened, a Hearthstone tournament winner named uh, Blitzchunk at a tournament, um, he made some remarks expressing support for the current Hong Kong protest movement. And in response to this, a Blizzard removed all his prize money from the tournament, banned him from tournaments for a year, banned him from competitive play for a year, and not only that, but fired the two broadcasters uh, who were interviewing him at the time. They've since rescinded... Um, the firing of the uh, of the casters, and now they just have a six month suspension. They've uh, changed Blitzchunk's suspension to six months and given him back his prize money, but the damage has kind of been done at this stage. And now, here we are. Yeah, um, this is one of the few times I can remember where gamer outrage has kind of got it right, to be honest with you. Um, I'm actually, like, weirdly proud that people kind of all got together with, like, no, this isn't going to fly with us. Um, I think for various reasons. If, if I had to guess the main one, it would be that they were punishing a person for, for not even really being overtly, I, I would say, political um, in, in a way. He was expressing his opinion. Obviously, it means a lot to him. Uh, I don't think you can fault him for obviously looking at something that's that important and having an opinion on it. Uh, Blizzard kind of came back around in their statement and said it was about making our stage his stage, which I don't agree with. I don't think that that's what, really what happened. Um, it, them saying that China had no input or ch it had nothing to do with China, I think anybody with any kind of common sense is going to look at that and say, no way. 
Yeah. Um, Anything they it, say about that bullshit is immediately proved wrong by the firing of the broadcasters. Yep, like, if exactly. it just been about him saying the thing, then they would have just punished him. The fact that they went, like, fucking scorched earth on it, then, yeah, yeah it's not about that. Yeah, yeah, it's not like they just tried censoring it when they deleted the video. They had to go a step farther, and then another step farther when they canceled his prize money and suspended him. For acts, there's no reason they could possibly justify doing. And I th There's okay. nothing that says they can take that money away from him for comments like that. Right. And I think a lot of people had some good points online that their statements that they released to the U.S. public and the statements that they released – I don't know how to say this word, honestly. Weibo? Yeah, Weibo. 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 Yeah. I don't know how to say it, but yeah. <laughs> the fucking we will protect the dignity of China. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You guys are going about this in the wrong angle if you think that that's what people are looking for a company to do is protect the dignity of China. Um, I mean, that's for their their Chinese audience, so I get why sure. they're saying that. But it does reveal that there is – they have to be lying to one group of people about this. Like, do they yeah. think we can't see that? Like, <laughs> like, do they, they do realize that, that – Posted the thing of like, hey, it had nothing to do with China. Like, dude – we're on the internet. We can fucking go to Weibo. It's not blocked or anything. Like, yeah. it's very commonly used. Like, especially like in Chinese communities in North America, they use that as a service. Like, politicians of Chinese descent use it to to network with constituents in, in the in these countries. Like, it's not something that's alien to us they can't be that dumb right uh i guess they are contrary i'm not even saying i don't want like i don't want looking at people pat me on the back or whatever but what i actually was i canceled my uh warcraft 3 reforged pre-order because i and i heard this from lots and lots and lots of my gaming friends and i mean not all of them who are the same political alignment to be honest with you something about this controversy or the way this hit it just it led to people canceling and you know re redoing pre-orders and, and and just in mass um i really think that blizzard wasn't prepared for this i think they thought people are just going to ignore it in in the united states um and yeah you have potentially a billion customers in china but i gotta feel like that blizzard's always been at least somewhat you know been a, a company that gets paid for by their american sales as well um so I, I don't know how much of this was an actual yes gamers got something good done for once uh by hitting blizzard's bottom line and how much was them just kind of realizing that it was bad pr because literally like you said congressmen are like no this isn't what we're doing um but to, to see them yeah, kind of go ahead sorry you keep going to see them change course rapidly uh, i or not even rapidly took up a couple of days felt like they were trying to put something together to kind of please both sides the entire time. This is on the heels of the NBA thing, right? So this isn't happening in a vacuum. Yeah, um, this is part of the reason it blew up so big. That was like these two things happening right in a row. Right. Um, I, I just kind of uh, – seeing the whole thing happen and shake out the way it did, I don't know if there's going to be a satisfying answer to everyone where people are like, okay, well, you know, Blizzard is this, Blizzard is that. But I feel pretty good right now. Um about walking away from blizzard for right now and, and kind of a petty punishment way to do it and just say look guys this isn't who you should be especially a company that i think everybody five six seven years ago was was basically the gold standard for pc gaming um and to see what they've become now is just kind of it, it it sucks um it, it's not a it's not a fun thing to see happen in one of your favorite companies honestly um, yeah i might I might push it more on five or six years ago because I have some opinions for that later on when we talk about some of our other topics. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they were a standard. And then I think part of their miscalculation is if they had just censored it, if they just deleted the videos and left it at that, no one would have cared. Mm -hmm. It's when they took the step too far that suddenly it hit people in ways that just people could relate to and could easily see this was just wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, things i've seen like just like go on twitter and everything like there's usually like the two factions on like games there's like the fucking like crazy gaming gator like insane people and then there's like people that are normal and like yeah they're yeah. all in agreement on this which is like the first time i've seen that since like fucking jack thompson <laughs> like, it's, it's like this doesn't happen that everyone's like across both sides are like man 
fuck these guys, but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's the t- it's one of the times they deserved it, which I think is good. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine what must be going on at that company right now. Employees oh, aren't happy. They're, yeah. they're like, yeah. some of them are walking yeah, out. Like yeah. Um, people are planning on protesting at BlizzCon. How are they going to stop that? You know, it's it's a shit show for them. Yeah. Uh, I'm so excited to watch BlizzCon, hey. I, they've made a lot of missteps just in general, right? But I can I can look past and at least kind of understand Mobile Diablo or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, okay, yeah, that makes sense, right? But some of the other stuff they've been doing, it just kind of all pales in comparison to something like this where it's like, we're going to take away money, we're going to suspend somebody, we're going to punish people who kind of were just happened to be there. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's it's a, such an over-course correction, an overreaction that I think that basically everybody saw it was like, yeah, this isn't cool. We can't... I don't yeah, we want, can't condone this. Yeah, exactly. I'm not necessarily saying that it, it should be nothing but politics or that we should be, you know, um, expecting to see more and more of this. Or, But I, I think their reaction was so far in the other direction that common sense and just looking at it for most people was, was really like, yeah, this is, is too much. This is wrong. So it's good to it, see. Yeah. It, it's actually a good um, point you bring up with Mobile Diablo because I think that touches on the same thing here where the problem there was a wild miscalculation on how it would be received and how they presented it. Mm-hmm. So it seems like they have a very significant marketing and PR problem that their PR team doesn't know what the hell they are doing yeah, back yeah. there right now. <laughs> like a good example would be, I think pretty much around the same time, Microsoft announced Gears 5 and they announced uh, that weird Funko Pop oh, Gears game, right? Yeah, yeah Gears yeah, Pop. Yeah. But so they, Microsoft wasn't like the game you've been waiting for. Like they kind of trolled people with it, you know, but then they announced Gears 5 anyway. It feels like they didn't do that with uh, the equivalent on it um, for what you call it for for Diablo. They just were like, hey, here's your mobile game. And it left people saying, what the hell? I didn't want a Diablo well, mobile game. Wait, you know? Is Diablo like, Immortal out my now? Point. Blizzard doesn't know what they're doing with their marketing team yeah. right now. You need to get somebody on that. And, and no, Diablo mobile is still not out. So if that gives you kind of any idea about how long it's been, it's been at least that long since Diablo Mobile was announced and still not out. So <laughs> Yeah, like, it's been a year. Yeah. Yeah, that's ridiculous. You think if you're like mobile games, you think of these things as coming out the door pretty quickly. Exactly that. I mean, you get people hyped and then it comes out. I, like usually with those type of mobile games at E3 or those kind of presentations, it's like, like it's out and now. now you and, can go yeah, download it right now. From like the they do a Fallout shelter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did, I don't know what um, Blizzard's thinking, man. I just don't know. Uh, it's it's a weird time. But like I said, if people are going to pick a cause to rally around, I feel like this is actually one of the better ones. Um, so it's good for it's good in my opinion that at least this aligns with you know something that I do believe in. I I think the idea of it you know being a revolution of our time and all that stuff is is a true one, and it's interesting to see how it plays out. But um, I think that. If I was a company or if I was Blizzard, I would say, okay, everybody take a step back, you know, just let this play out. And if they bring us in through comments, like we're just going to say, look, we're a video game company, you know. And I know that's kind of like a, you know, a weak excuse when it comes to lots of politics. But I think it's going to be very hard to make a stand on anything when you're, when you're not in it this time. So um, I don't know. I'm not expecting Blizzard to come out and say free Hong Kong. And I'm not expecting them to, you know, toe the, the Chinese line either. I, there's sometimes where I think it's okay to be a third party. So, but uh, it'll be interesting to see where they yeah. go. From there. Um, like so many companies kind of, they get away with being cowardly and Blizzard mm-hmm. could have just, you know, equivocated and they chose not to. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I always think what's the line that Michael Jordan had about like, he doesn't, Republicans buy shoes too or something like that when people were asking them, you know, and I, I don't think they need to go that far into it. I don't think they need to have no, like, be, like, completely neutral. But I do think that going the exact opposite way and and basically towing the party line is, is just as dangerous because it sends a really weird message to people. Um, yeah, especially absolutely. Hong Kong is, is a huge blizzard market. I gotta imagine almost all those countries are, you know? Um, South Korea is basically fueled by blizzard. Um when it comes to their their esports so yeah i don't know blizzard i think is is in for some rough times ahead not only because it's because all their games all kind of seem you know played out and i think while wild, wild classic was a 
a streamer thing, I haven't really noticed too many of my friends sticking with it. It was kind of like a nostalgia blast for a month or two, well, but I think... Uh, the I classic st- thing is going to be, like, they released Wild Classic, and it was, like, how everyone wanted, like, all that bullshit and everything. But they fucking put those changes in for a reason, because everyone got bored of it when mm-hmm. it was like that. So that's just going to happen again. I don't get Wild Classic, okay? <laughs> I, yeah, I know I some people are still but... playing it, but, like, I don't know. I've only overheard them talk about it, so I can't say much. Um, anyway, uh, let's move on to discuss what we've been playing lately. So, I've been playing a game called that you might have heard of called Untitled Goose Game. Really? <laughs> I expected you to like this for some reason. I'm kind of like I'm not in a bad way, but you know, Merv usually likes like quirky indie stuff, right? Like kind of up your alley type thing. But as soon as I started to see it, I was like, I don't think Merv's gonna like this actually, because it looks like what is that? Fumble core mixed with just kind of aimlessness, right? Is that it's what you're a finding, or is it fumble core stealth puzzler? I guess <laughs> it's. I mean, it's not a bad game. It's just, right. I expected, oh man, this is going to be my top 10 of 2019. Yeah, and it's going to be amazing. I'm going to enjoy the hell of it. And it's it's all right. Like, there's just not very much to it. It's really repetitive. Mm-hmm. And there's some cleverness to it, but most of it is really just not, it's like you go up to someone and you honk at them and they freak out. Okay, cool. Yeah. Like it, it's funny the first five times you do it, but then you need to keep doing it. And I, I should say there there are some clever bits of level design. It's not like a, a badly made game. It's just not something that I'm really latching on to, unfortunately. Mm. And I, don't, I, I mean, I don't begrudge anyone their enjoyment of it. I like all the goose memes. It's just, eh, it's not really yeah, my thing. Sorry. I haven't played the actual game, but the memes are what I'm getting out of it. <laughs> the good ones out there. Yeah, I haven't touched the game yet, but I fucking love the memes. Yeah, uh, I think my favorite is the one where it's just the the goose with the the picnic basket. It says, "I think I will cause problems on purpose." <laughs> yeah, it looks interesting. I mean, it, it looks like something I I personally would probably buy. You know, seventy five percent off on a Steam sale and play for a couple hours and forget I own it. Uh, and you mean my... an Epic Games sale? Cause yeah, exactly. Epic on Steam. Epic, Epic in six months. Um, oh yeah, that's the that's probably the other reason I'm kind of pissed off at it is that. Uh, I don't want to be lumped in with a bunch of troglodytic dipshits, but <laughs> the Epic Games client just sucks so yeah. bad. It's uh, such a broken fucking piece of software. Um, like it, it you can't. You have to run it as an administrator, otherwise it won't install patches properly. Um, if you're on one game store page and you search for another game, the client just hangs forever. Um. Sometimes the homepage won't load. It's such a broken piece of shit. And I understand why people get pissed off about it. But, oh dear God, it's yeah, so... I, I think uh, there's a good spot to talk about how Epic, the software store, isn't as good as like the stuff that's on it. I don't necessarily begrudge them. I think we've talked about this before for how they've kind of bought their way into the market i don't care same shit steam did if you remember um same thing consoles do i don't i don't care about that part of it but if you're gonna buy your way into a market at least kind of be ready for prime time when you start driving people to the market and then finding out this thing lacks pretty basic functions um yeah i don't know how much you mess with it is there a uh like a, a basket like no, yeah, <laughs> still, like, the they still don't have a shopping cart. Yeah. So I bought three games on there. I bought um, Untitled Goose Game, uh, Control, and What the Golf. And I had to make three separate purchases, which is, oh mm-hmm. my god. Get your shit together, guys. Seriously. It, it still sounds better than you play when that first came out. Cause yeah. Oh yeah, you play is still a garbage crash Every time you tried to do anything in the games you were playing. <laughs> Like I've I've pretty much been a, a stand for um which we'll call it for origin? for origin but I think that was the one store that I think like at launch pretty much had it all put together, but um you play was probably the worst and I think probably the best was somewhere in the long lines of um 
galaxy god galaxy but that was only because at that point they had the storefront all taken care of all all god really was was kind of like a ui app you know yeah um as an overlay but uh yeah man i i uh shit uh i i don't know if you're done talking about goose game but if you're not feel free to go back oh no i'm done there's not much to it it's fun you might find it fun it's okay Eh. The only reason I want to talk about it is because I have also been playing an epic game and kind of running into some of the similar annoyances. I've been playing Surviving Mars. Oh, uh, yeah. That was, was free on the yeah. Epic Game Store. Uh, again, I'd recommend picking it up because it's free. I don't know if you... Have you ever played games like that? Just kind of SimCity-ish type games. But if you're into that style, this is a good one. Uh, oh, it's... The fact- I- I thought it was a survival game, not a city builder. No, no, no. It's that's a good thing. Yeah, it's so basically you pick one of I don't know ten different factions, and it's you need to go to Mars and basically build up a colony, and you're you're controlling like concrete versus metal versus you know if you mine too much concrete, it makes a lot more dust, which makes your solar panels not work as well. There's a lot of like little intricate things here and there, uh, city management style. Um, getting it on Epic was kind of weird though because they gave you the game free and there's also three or four free uh, DLCs, but it doesn't really show you that. You have to manually, so like you, you get the game for free and you have to manually go back and check for the DLC and then add the DLC to your cart and also buy the free DLC, which I would, if my thinking would be, why don't you just give us all as like a package basically if it's all free? Who cares? Um, oh, yeah, Epic. The Epic Games Store probably does not have the ability to do that right now. That's what I'm thinking. That's when we said they don't have a shopping cart. That's probably why they don't. <laughs> oh, um, dear God. I, yeah. I really enjoy Surviving Mars, though. I think it's it's a really kind of fun gameplay loop. Uh, I don't want to... I don't know if you can really spoil a city builder or anything like that. But eventually you get to a scenario where... Um, so you get a lot of your resources early on back from, from Earth, right? So you're sending them weird Mars stuff. They're sending you, you know, food and things like that. Uh, eventually kind of World War Three breaks out and you can basically try to fix Earth or <laughs> you can be like, fuck you guys, I'm going my own way, Mars can is you, dependent. Wait, can you nuke the planet? Because that no, would be great. You, there's no like like war or anything like that. But So what there is, there's basically like a meter at top. I can't remember what it's called. It's like threat of war or something like that, right? So there's a lot of like basically story beats um, where it says, hey, you want to accept a bunch of colonists for example from earth they're gonna come here and they're gonna fuck your shit up because they're already unhappy so they have i think what they call the renegade stat renegade status Uh, sorry (laughs) it's not not that weird but um, renegade yeah Yeah. they show up so they're 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 renegade status if you accept them to your colony they're basically fucking criminals so option one is hey are you going to accept a bunch of these criminals more or less or are you gonna say you know what screw you earth you made your own problems go go try to fix them yeah, I'm not letting anybody else come to Mars. Um, or like Earth will say, hey, we're trying to build supposedly hospitals. Uh, you know, Wait, help- so you can make Mars great again? Yeah, basically. Yeah, you can. <laughs> well, I don't know about again, but great. Um, and so it, you can basically tell Earth to pound sand the whole time and just keep everything yourself and not send them rare Earth materials or rare metals to go rebuild their shit. You can just be like, nah, this is all going to me. Um but then, of course, you know, if you start doing stuff like that, you start to piss off your basically the people who were sending you resources early on. And there's some pros and cons to it. But the fact that I've never really seen a game do something like that before in a weird way, it seems like it would be kind of standard, but I've never really seen that happen. So it was kind of interesting to make a choice and pick between kind of your benefactor in those types of games. And then I guess the people you just, you know, are trying to build a, a society for. So I kind of went a, uh, a Mars first route, not to lie. I think it, it played out in really fun ways. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's fun to kind of explore those possibilities when you're just, you know, sitting behind your computer screen and you can kind of explore those consequences without having to worry about, you know, real people getting harmed. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I wouldn't recommend doing it in real life. But yeah, there's there's a lot of the choices that you make are, are kind of silly. I don't want to say silly, but it's like, Hey, there, a comet appears. Do you want to send back word that, hey, we found the comet of peace on Mars and we recommend that, you know, you guys stop fighting? Or do you want to say, this is a sign that, the you know, the god of war is ready for more, you know, send more blood to Mars or whatever. So you can <laughs> kind of amazing. have some stuff like that. Yeah. Um, there's a, uh, what do they call that? Your, and you guys might know, the European Song Contest. Eurovision. Yeah, yeah. There, there's like the equivalent of that for Mars. 
So like you can basically go try to beat Earth in in the Euro or in the Eurovision where it's Mars versus Earth. There's a lot of little kind of you know funny stuff like that. It's like that, a but... two contestant competition here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically, <laughs> I, I liked it a lot though. I, I, I for free, no reason not to get it except for it really did. Uh, I've been pretty neutral on epic store as a theory but in practice actually using the, the thing uh, i was pretty disappointed yet again with it all right um mike what have you been playing so after a hundred hours i finally decided to set down fire emblem's new game plus and picked up fate extella link which uh i was a little goaded into it after one of our previous prompts because i bought the special edition of this back in like oh april right when it came out because um if you've been around the the Japanese pop cultural thread, you should know I am a avowed Fate fanboy, so I was obligated okay, to buy like this. Like, you, you watch the cooking shows and everything. Hey, that <laughs> cooking show was amazing. <laughs> Everybody should watch uh, today's recipe for them, yes, household. Um, but back to the game. This is actually a Musou game that's a sequel to uh, Fate Excel, which came out, I think, two years ago or so. Which okay. is a sequel to an RPG from the PSP from earlier. It gets a weird spin-off franchise. I'll skip all uh, just to focus on this one. So Most what of... I'm going to put in the link dump is that Giga video where he explains the Fate franchise. And it sounds ridiculous, but literally everything he says in that video is true. Which um, is, yes, that is a very good uh, description of everything. Um, It's a little old because he doesn't get to some of the newer stuff. <laughs> <laughs> It's anyway. a weird, weird franchise here. Okay. Um, so tell us about Fate Extella. Extella Link. Extella Link. Fate Extella is the earlier Musou game. Okay. Basically, it's a Musou game. Um, as far as Musou games go, it's a little bit more simplistic than, say, like Hyrule Warriors or, or some of the more um, well-known ones like that. It plays better than the earlier Extella did. It's got some um, some design improvements so the enemies pop better. They've got a little better designs to them. So far my biggest grievance um, well my biggest grievance is there's alternate costumes for some of the characters if you had uh, beat the previous game but I beat that on my PS4 and I'm playing this on my Switch so now I'm just mad at myself. <laughs> Otherwise was- there's just some kind of UI um Leveling up with money, which you can do in like any Musou game, is a massive pain in the ass here. I'll probably go into that more at the thread on Monday, though. So, <laughs> uh, just they didn't design the menus very well, or so the short end of it is you can't swap straight from one character to another character to spend money to level them up. You have to have a character selected who you're playing as, and that's who you level up with your money. So if you want to do multiple characters at once, you have to keep backing out of one menu, change who you're playing as, go into the money um, menu, level them up, back out, repeat ad nauseum. And wow. you, like, how, how many characters are there, are there, though? How many characters are we looking at? Well, like, recently I just got three characters who joined me at the same time after one mission, but I think there's up to 30 characters in the game. Fuck that. <laughs> Yep, I that mean, was not something designed with convenience yeah, in mind. Well, you want to keep them all at the same level. There's a lot of characters you'd be throwing money at. I get the idea is probably that um, just whoever you're playing at, you're going to level up and not worry about leveling up the others until you come around to playing them for a mission. It's just oddly designed if you're trying to keep them all at the same level all the time. <laughs> he just... Five characters or something. I thought, I thought we were just going to like play as your favorite waifu or whatever and then i think that's probably what they're expecting right yeah, everybody has their favorite ex- character back you need to jump around all the time but uh i'm still pretty early in it i'm only in like the third or fourth mission so it's, i haven't got i've only got like six people unlocked right now the summons or do you play as the wizard people you actually, um, in this one compared to the previous one, the master who actually is the summoner is actually running around in the field and can get hurt, but you're actually playing as the, the servants themselves I'm running around. The okay, I, I have no idea what any of this means, <laughs> but I'm just going to assume that you are playing... You're playing as female as... Emperor Nero, okay? Yeah, okay. alright, I'm in. I, I, like... <laughs> you just sold me in two or... <laughs> in one phrase. <laughs> 
Okay, now, now I'm on board with this. Where can I buy it? You also can play as female Sir Francis Drake, which gets weird. <laughs> so I can play as Lara Croft, but anime Lara Croft. Yes. <laughs> okay, what you're playing as, Merv, is you know the chicken Keijo who summoned all the butts from the portals behind her? I, I, all the Keijo girls have like, have like more, have like merged into one boob butt girl in my head. <laughs> boob butt girl? <laughs> Sorry, hip whip girl. I believe that is the proper terminology. Uh, um, <laughs> so, wait, wait, which was it one of the four main girls? Yeah, and she could like do the thing where she copies everyone's abilities. Oh, she was the soft spoken one. Yeah, and she like. That thing where she summons all the butts behind her in glowing portals is just a thing from Fate. Yeah, it's a copy of Gilgamesh's oh, attack. Yeah, it's, like yeah, it's the... What was it called the, in the show? The Gates of Bootylon instead of the Gates of Babylon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Now I remember. It was all butt puns. It's been a while since I've seen that show. Um, hey, it's the best show ever made, by the way, if you guys haven't watched it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if I want the games <laughs> cast to endorse Keijo. Um... All you need to know about it is that there are eight exclamation marks in the title. That's right, I counted them. There are eight. <laughs> um, so yeah, from so fate. My understanding of, of fate is that it's like Keijo, but with less boobs and butts. Oh no, 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 no! So Francis Drake is probably rocking some quadruple G's there. <laughs> okay, okay. No, let's put it this way: the original fate is hentai. Like, wow. no fucking. Out, it's a straight up porn visual novel. Was yeah, this the, the hentai scenes are forced in there. There's only a few of them, and they're you can get by them. And there's a reason they dropped them out on the PS2 all porn. It's was, they're not necessary. They're not okay. like some other visual novels. It does make watching the show really weird. Where there's a bit where it's like cutting to like just for no reason, the character will be like being felt up in their underwear and shit. Like, I didn't realize it was a hentai thing at first when I watched the show. And then I'm, like, talking to my mate about it. It's like, yeah, dude, it was a fucking porn. And, like, yeah, that makes so much more about this show makes sense. I remember, like, a couple weeks back that there was, like, a big controversy that that Switch was going to allow a game that was basically that. Is this that game? No, no. The the original fake game is from, like, 2004. Okay. It's like a visual novel. Yeah, and most of the ports since then have, they got rid of them the hentai stuff really early to it. Uh Yeah, it's basically just the original game and its immediate direct sequel, Hollow Knight or Axia, and then all of the subsequent games have never fed into that at all. (laughs) Okay. So, if I want my anime porn fix, I should look (laughs) elsewhere. (laughs) I believe, uh, according to Shinigami Apple Merchant, uh, you know... A love song at the end of the world has a lot more hentai in it, and it's just a lot more pornish than than Fate was. He had a nice dissertation on that a couple of weeks ago. Um, <laughs> you know what? I will stick to the legless anal sex of Katawa Shoujo. Sorry for the spoilers, <laughs> by the way, if you haven't played that game. Um, no, that game is actually legitimately good. Um, yeah, here I am shilling for a game that has for a visual novel that has sex scenes in it. Um, but yeah, it's actually legitimately good. Um, ben, you said you were excited to tell us about what you've been playing. What have you been playing? I've been playing Greedful, and it's fucking great. Is it? Awesome. That's great news. Like, um, so that's the new game from guys... Spiders, right? Yeah, have any of you guys played Spiders games before? Uh, is Risen... Are... Did they make Risen? No, no, that game fucking sucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, why no, why no, is the no, only no, pirate no. RPG such garbage? Yeah. Anyway. I played Risen 2, I played it for about 10 minutes and quit, because that might be the worst, like, post, like, N64 era game I've ever played. Yeah, that's like, why I was curious, because I thought that this was the same company, but apparently not. Uh, Spiders did, um, Bound by Flame, they did the original of Walks and Men that got spun off into the the Goblin Stealth series. Uh, um, Mars Star- Warlogs. Sorry? Mars Warlogs. That's another one they made. Yeah, they made... I haven't actually played that one. They also made, uh, like, Tinkomancer, which is, like, a Mars, like, sci-fi RPG, which I think is similar to Warlogs and kind of, like, ties into it a bit. And then they've made this one, which is, like, uh, like 17th century colonialist fantasy RPG, which Ooh. is... Oh. 
Yeah. It's just a fucking weird setting for a game, but it's so cool. Basically, you're, like, from this, like, merchant country thing, and there's, like, this horrible plague, like, fucking up your entire country, and you've gone to this island to, along with three other countries, have, like, all gone to explore this island to, like, try and find a cure for this disease, and then there are, like, native people on the island who are, like, not well pleased with you, and it basically plays out, like, there's no real villain in it, there's just, like, these, like, five different factions, and they all have their own wants and needs, and all, that all kind of, kind of, like, comes into conflict with each other, and so, like, you're going around, like, trying to just get a cure in the midst of all this bullshit going on. Um, where it gets really interesting is, like, so spiders, their games basically are games they've made with, like, a design document for, like, some triple A hyper budget massive, like, open RPG, but then they have to make it on, like, 10 bucks of Wishes and Strength. <laughs> like, so, don't get me wrong, this game's jank as fuck. Like, when I got to the island, I had to fight a bunch of, like, one of the first areas I go to, I fight a bunch of wolves, and the frame rate drops to, like, 10 frames. <laughs> <laughs> Like, the, the moment you touch it, like, your kind of character controls, like, too responsibly, if that makes sense. And I just immediately ran into a wall instead of, like, kind of turning down a hallway. And it it's weird, and it feels weird to play. But they always have, like, really big ideas. Oh. So, like... Are you playing this on Xbox or PC or...? Xbox One. Xbox One, okay. Um, so, yeah, it might actually run well on not shit consoles. Um, oh... Huge slam on Xbox out of nowhere. I love my Xbox, but let's be fucking real here. Oh. Um, like, so you yeah, run down a hall, and then shit happens, and... Oh, yeah, so that's just, like, the controls feel weird. But, like, uh, and so, like, technically, it's not, like, an impressive game and everything, but the art direction is fucking amazing. Like, the first town you're in is maybe one of my favorite areas in a video game, like, this generation. It kind of feels like if you went to the Bloodborne, if you went to Yarnum, but like on like a good day. <laughs> okay. Like the I... festival. <laughs> yeah, which like Bears Yarnum, down. good day still means there's like corpses on the street dying from the plague and there's like a bonfire burning the bodies in the middle of the city. But like still, it's a good day for Yarnum, you know? I can, I can dig that. I think that, that, that's a. I think the setting that they've got is. is using a bunch of aesthetics that are kind of underused outside of maybe some of the ass creeds. So yeah, that is one thing that like fucking you go to the island and it feels so much like you know that bit in Assassin's Creed 3 where you get off the boat as Haytham and it's your first like getting into the town on like the mainland of America and like that kind of thing. That's like what it feels like getting off the boat onto that it just gave me really hard vibes of that and it'll, especially with um so each of the countries i was telling about like have set up a major city on the town and each city has like their very own distinct like architecture style and everything so there's like your city is like the you're like the merchant guild kind of thing and it's all very like um english kind of setting and everything but then you go to like the alcan guild and they're all like very turkish and middle eastern and gives you that Assassin's Creed 1 vibe really hard. That's cool. And then you go to the, like, there's this kind of, like, religious fanatic faction, and they're all, like, Spanish conquistadors and all that shit, which then kind of ties in again. They all have, like, their own distinct, like, ways of dressing and all that kind of shit. But, like, so if you need to sneak into a place on, like, the Spanish place, you can either, like, use your stealth abilities and everything, or go and, like, kill a Spanish guard or something and make sure you're dressed, like, the Spanish style, and then, like, you can, like, walk around and not get noticed too bad in those areas. So there's, like, this whole kind of, like, costume system. So it's which, basically like, every Ascreed game rolled into one. Yeah. No, it's more Dragon Age Inquisition, honestly. Okay. It's, like, hard RPG, like, dialogue choices and everything. Some high it's praise. Also got, it's also got, like, um... You know how Dragon Age Inquisition was a bunch of, like, it wasn't a big open world, but it was a bunch of smaller open areas. Yeah. It's like that, but the areas are a lot small. Like, the areas are a lot smaller, but they're big enough to feel expansive, but not big enough to feel overwhelming. They're about the size of, like, you know in, like, Assassin's Creed, um, 
what's the new one? Odyssey. When you like go to a small island and there's like lots of like self-contained little stuff to do on the island, mm-hmm. like about that size for each little zone, which I think is like just a really good size. It feels nice. But then the thing I really didn't expect about this game is it kind of ends up being a Metroidvania as well. But instead of having like you get to a certain point and you get a grappling hook to get over it, you have a skill tree. Because you have the three skill trees. One is your move, like you learn new moves and like can throw grenades or spells or whatever. One is like you just level up like your strength, so you like do more damage with two-handed weapons or all that like usual bullshit. But then there's like the out of combat skill tree, which is like you can level up your lock picking, you can level up your science, which like lets you build like potions and everything. But also, if you get your science to a high enough level, you can build bombs to break down wall like thin walls and get to new areas. If you get your like figure to a certain area like level you can bounce across balance beams or like climb up walls if you get your like dexterity to a certain level you can like squeeze through small gaps and get new areas so when you're going through an area there'll be all these areas you can't get to yet and it really gives off that metroidvania vibe which i fucking adore but what it ends up feeling like is i reckon it feels like a game that bioware would have made in in a world where they didn't get bought out by EA and start making, like, AAA games and started, like, kept doing, like, kind of, like, the weird, janky shit, like, Dragon Age Origins and everything, but with that weird experimentation side to it. Okay, I can, like, kind of like Jade Empire. Like yeah. A weird, like, a weird experimental game that um, had, like, yeah. It's got fucking problems, obviously, but, like... I, I wonder why it's... I thought it was the Risen, guys. I, maybe it was just the way it looked. <laughs> So yeah. the Risen guys are Piranha Bites. They're the guys who made Gothic and Elex. Yeah. They're based in Germany. I believe Spiders is Spiders in French. France. Yeah. yeah. And both of these companies have somewhere between 25 and 35 employees. Oh. Well, so, was... yeah. Like, for a 35 employee game, this is a fucking impressive game. Like, it's... Like, again, is the technical side isn't that great, but, like, the art direction is fucking astounding. It does... It's really good at that thing where, like, you go around a corner and it, like, frames a view of the city you're coming to really well. Oh, yeah. That is, um... That is really hard to do. I think very few games, especially games that are very open, do it well. Like, this game... Yeah, this game does it. Like, um, that's the thing. I think with the smaller little areas, it can do that much, much better. And, like... Yeah, honestly, if you're interested in, like, RPGs and fantasy RPGs and everything, I couldn't recommend this high enough. You just have to get through kind of that level of jank to... One of the things that you mentioned reminded me of, um, like, when you get to that city and there's, like, all that different architecture and different things. Uh, I don't know if you ever played uh, Final Fantasy XIV, the online one. They had a lot of cities where that was kind of going on. Like, just basically, like, a hub where all the cities kind of meet together and you get the different architecture and different feels in the cities. I always love that in games makes this city feel a lot more alive you know when you've got yeah, like yeah. different districts and different whatever it, it's less okay well this is the architecture that we just use in this city for no reason um so that, i really like that type of type of thing in games too it like goes really hard on that because then in the city like there are the there's the factions there's the basically the merchant guild the alchemists the religious nut jobs the sailors and the mercenaries and the natives so like but all the town guards in all across the towns are all belong to the same faction of mercenary guilds. So then they'll have like the kind of like mercenary section in all the towns, and those will be really similar across the board as the rest of the city is all like dependent on the country and all that kind of shit. Mm-hmm. So it like goes out really, really hard, and it's like one of my favorite bits of it. All right. So anything else you want to say about? Um, you missed the segue I kind of led into before. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I, I, I'm kind of like I aware in an alternate universe thing, and it like playing really well. I'm like, ooh, it was almost like this was planned, but nah, fuck it. Um, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention because <laughs> I am tired, and I slept four hours last night. But let's pretend that the segue worked, and we are now talking about. <laughs> Oh, I'm so bad at this. I'm, I'm rusty. I missed the last podcast. Yeah, it um, went off. That's what happens. Yeah, I, I take some time off, and uh, now I'm off my game. Um, by the way, you guys did a great job with it. Oh, thanks. Uh, I, I very much appreciated. I was um, all bones. I, I just edited it. 
Yeah, so thank you to to Bones and uh, Breakman, Kappa, Ben, and newcomer and Anomaly, whom we'd love to have back to uh, chat about some Sims and some other things. Um, anyway, so let's pretend we did a segue and we're talking about <laughs> alternate realities now. Let's pretend we're in the alternate reality where I did a segue. Uh, <laughs> and let's talk about you know, some some good what-ifs. And the what-if that I want to begin with is what if Sega still made consoles? Yeah. Wait, back up. There was a Risen 3. Yeah. There was a Risen 3. It, it got really, really bad reviews. And pretty much killed off the series. So, good. let's... What if Risen were actually good? <laughs> like, what if we got... Let, okay, let's start with that. Fuck it. What if, what if there were, like, an actually good pirate RPG series out there? And it was on the Sega console? Are we... <laughs> no, okay, I'm serious. Let, let's let's, do, Sega, let's yeah. do Sega after this. What if there were, like, an actual good pirate RPG franchise? I, so, here's the thing. I, this is what I've... Kind of went into it. Like... I... I... I don't think you really can. I, I This is just me thinking. There's a lot of stuff about piracy that doesn't exactly... You know, there's the romanticized version of pirates, and then there's what pirates are really up to. Do you know what I mean? I think it'd be really hard to portray kind of a... Mm, I don't know how to describe it. I don't I don't want to say PC, but kind of like a, like a sanitized version of pirates that yeah. felt real and felt interesting at the same time. I mean do parts of the caribbean that worked. they did and i think the game was just okay but i don't think that's oh, what people want game. i mean like the movie like oh it was that style of like kind of like almost a fantasy world with the pirates like i think there's games that do air pirates or fantasy pirates or stuff like that but i i think if you're looking for an actual authentic experience it's really hard to do um because <laughs> remember pirates also like while being you know rapists murderers thieves all that stuff they're also really desperate like uh, I don't know, have you have you ever watched Black Sails? No, sorry, yeah, but that, isn't that that's what with Catherine like Winnick, right? Like, What's that? Black Sails is like fucking Long John Silver. It's not exactly a no, no. It's book. it's uh, it's a combination. There's there's a mix of real pirates with like legendary pirates. Is kind of how they describe it. So you've got Blackbeard alongside Captain Hook, basically, um, or not Captain Hook, but uh, Long so John Captain... Silver. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, but I, I think the way that show kind of does what it does a great job of is explaining that pirates are extremely desperate people. They, they are basically fugitives on the run on the ocean at all times, um, which puts you in a really, really interesting spot when it comes to what you're willing to do to, to you know, get out of things or, or put yourself in and out of situations that a normal person probably would walk away from. Um, so I think there's something that you have would have to be able to do that in an RPG that I don't know if most players would feel comfortable because sometimes when a game puts you in a situation like that, you can't talk or fight your way out of, you're kind of stuck playing that. So I don't know if an RPG pirate would work, but the action games I think generally have. So that's probably what I'd see. Pirates it would definitely stuff. have to be <clears throat> more of an indie game. It's not something you're going to get a major release of because it would be very more niche cult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking more along like a pirate fantasy lines. Okay. Yeah, like, like Sea of Thieves-ish. But, uh, you know, it, not um, terrible. Gull and Bones in an RPG? I don't even know what the fuck that game is no, yet. It's, it's supposed to be a MOBA, but I... It's a MOBA? Like, yeah, what it's, the fuck? <laughs> so, so here's how it's going to be a MOBA. So, like, you are in a frigate, and I am in a dreadnought, right? And then, you know, we kind of get lanes, like ship lanes, and then we fight our ships against each other using the Assassin's Creed combat. That's what it was originally conceived as. Now, whether or not that's going to be the pro the you know, <laughs> what actually hits the streets, because that thing's been delayed that that forever. Been, like, like, when was that announced? It was like three, four years ago. Or yeah, two years ago, I believe. So I, I would say that if that's the game that comes out, I'll be I'll be straight up shocked because I think everybody heard and did exactly what you guys said. Wait, that's a fucking MOBA. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, that's kind of how it was originally conceived. If I don't know if you remember three or four years ago, there was a lot of weird MOBAs. Like there was a, a space MOBA called Dreadnought. Uh, I don't remember you, that. Are on giant. Wait, I don't know about ships. Dreadnought. I did not realize that was a fucking MOBA. Mm -hmm. There was another one called Fractured Space, and I think that this was going to be kind of the pirate version of that. So your character is more or less your ship, 
uh, and you level up your ship and things like that. I this is just what I read in like different like press junket release type things. Now that was three years ago and kind of when the game was in more conceptual phase, I think, than actually what will actually be coming out. But that's what a lot of the vibes they were saying that it was going to be that they didn't see any ship to ship or hand to hand combat. It didn't look like you were actually a pirate. It looks like you were. It was more focused on your you crew. Were a ship type yeah. Thing, yeah. That is not as fun as I thought it would be. I thought it was just like well, Ask Creed 4, but without all the bullshit. Hence four years of dev time, I guess, you know, trying to chase that you know, dragon of what makes this fun. But uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if that's actually going to be what what sees the light of day. Um, but yeah, I I think piracy is a hard one to deal with. It's It seems like it's a area just perfect for video games and it's always been kind of just never really hit the mark um maybe sid meyer's pirates kind of was maybe one of the pinnacles monkey island but that's more of a comedy game than anything yeah and don't get me wrong i love monkey island but i want my pirate rpg like my dream game would be if dragon age 4 were set off the antivan and ravani coasts Uh and you just like played as a pirate in the Dragon Age world. Uh, I'm sold. Make yeah. it. I'll play it. <laughs> you should play Risen 2 then. It's really good. It's so bad. They're... I'm not... I, it feels like... It feels like you're... Um, you're like... You know, that, that kid who, who pranks the... Like his... like that, that, The bully who pranks the kid in high school. They're just like... Oh yeah, you should wear your underwear on the outside tomorrow. It's a new fashion. We're all gonna do it. <laughs> Did that happen, to you, Mer? That... Um, <laughs> That's really specific. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I couldn't think of stuff that like because I wasn't like I'm an idiot, but I'm not that gullible. You'd have to find other ways to bully me. Like no, I know. you'd have to like the dumb ways You're that not I that I'm making up plans now to find good ways to bully you. <laughs> yeah, like. The time when I was in an undergrad and I uh, I left my I left my door open and then people uh, changed my homepage to, to Lemon Party. Oof. I don't know if yeah. those are friends. <laughs> yeah, that's all. I got I got him back. I, I changed his, his desktop to Lemon Party. Should probably he took his listeners lap- don't Google that. <laughs> yeah. So he. So what he did was. Uh, what he did was he didn't notice, and he took his laptop to class, and he sat in the front row, and then he opened his laptop, and then the entire class thought there was a loan party on his laptop. Uh, yeah, that might have been a, a bridge too far. After that, we just started like taking each other's shampoo and sticking it in like the freezer part of the little mini fridges that were in all our dorm rooms. So the big prank at our on our dorm was just like freezing people's shampoo. Ah, that's a little yeah. more. Also, it's dumb. I that was my idea. I don't know why I came up with that. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, so yeah, that's what you are, Ben. You're a friend. You're a shampoo freezer. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Well, this has been a weird divergence into uh, Merv's yeah. college life. We have an alternate reality. <laughs> yeah, the alternate reality where... Frozen shampoo. I, yeah, where frozen shampoo. The alternate reality where I went to school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's been like Merv therapy working through shit he went through. <laughs> yeah, this is the reason why I, I decided to, to like stay in school forever. Um don't go to grad school, kids. It's not a good idea. Uh, um, <laughs> come back around to Sega. I, I guess with Sega, I don't... Man, I'm not going to get in trouble with the... Uh, hopefully with the Sonic people. I, I hope not, but... I'm do you guys, right. There are no Sonic fans. Let's be real. Do they, do they have enough of a catalog, you think, to run a successful console for yes, yes, a whole other yes. generation? Like, okay, so on Dreamcast, we had the Sonic Adventure games. Like, mm-hmm. okay, let's imagine for a world where the Sonic Adventure games were good. Like, I'm assuming that's part of this fantasy reality. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of- Let your imagination run wild. Like, all the fucking arcade games, like the Crazy Taxi, the Daytona, all that shit, that's all Sega. And, like, now, like, if you even go into, like, what they ended up developing, they've got, like, the Yakuza games, they own Bayonetta. Like, um, all the- Atlas, they own them. Yeah, like, Sega, and, like, even back on fucking, um, 
like, I think most of the treasure games were Sega games. Like, um, fucking, oh, uh, what's the one that's like Contra? Oh, Beyond the fuck. Valkyrie Chronicle games. <laughs> oh yeah, that that series. And you know, it's watercolor also anime. Thing where... Gunstar Heroes, like Gunstar Heroes, was a Sega Mega Drive game. Um, like just Sega. Think... Yeah, there you go. In general, it's not a matter of if they had, you know, the catalog to begin with. You look at what Sony and Xbox did. They just built catalogs out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Sony just innovated and, you know, I mean, they obviously did create these new IPs since they went out of the console business. They could have built a catalog. They just couldn't run a console to save their lives. so I was blanking on shit that I shouldn't have been. But so, for like, just on Sega Dreamcast, we'll say... So Sonic Adventure, we'll imagine a new world where that's great. Shenmue, uh, that could have been a huge thing if anyone owned an sh- actual Dreamcast. Uh, <laughs> Jet Set, like Jet Set Radio, those games are fucking great. Um, Virtual Fighter could have been their big fighting game. They had Space Channel 5, which was like their fucking uh, DDR kind of game. They had Rez on that. They had, was Soul Calibur made by, no, that's Namco. So they had yeah, Virtual yeah. Fighter though. But like, that's it was like on the five, Dreamcast. <laughs> yeah, but that's like, five big games that they had that could have, like... Like, five exclusive franchises is a lot for... Like, that's what you need to start in Could you guys, like, imagine Alpha Protocol as a system seller? Yeah. That would have been a weird thing. To see what I reckon happened. So, I'm imagining in this world where Sega still makes console is because the Dreamcast was a smash hit, right? Like, that's... Okay, sure. That Which I reckon that means... Sony PlayStation 1 probably isn't, and kind of, like, I don't know if Sony become a major, like, console thing there, because then you've got, like, you've got, like, the three major Japanese developers all focusing on kind of, like, a similar kind of game. That's, like, that's, so. yeah, I think that would kind of be a, a really hard thing to, to, to deal with when you've got Nintendo, you've got Sega, and you've got Sony all kind of just fighting over like, a lot of those Japanese devs. Yeah. Because Sony's whole thing was we focused on, like, the adult games while Nintendo focused on kid games. But if you've got Sega doing, like, Shenmue and shit, like, they're already kind of doing that. And then I still think Xbox succeeds because they come out and they have a very different focus to everyone else. Yeah. And they're yeah. doing, like, their Western online FPS, Halo, all that shit. So I reckon Xbox probably are the same, I guess. You know what I'm thinking? In this alternate universe where, where Sony doesn't take off because Sega did, um, Amy Hennig writes Alpha Protocol. Ah, there you go. But Alpha Protocol was already well written. <laughs> yes, but now it's different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Alpha don't Protocol's have a... problems with its story or even its writing. I think, yeah. The I think its problem is just broken as fuck. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I think the other thing would be like, so Sega are an arcade developer. Their focus is always going to be on, like, crazy kind of, like, arcade games. Like, even now, fucking Yakuza is still, like, on that kind of... Yeah, very arcade-y, like, mini game Which means, like, Sony's big thing has been, like, the focusing on, like, cinematic, like, immersive stories and shit. But if Sony aren't a big developer, does that whole fucking video game thing exist? Like, do... I we... mean, it existed. Yeah. Like, it's, it's... That was pioneered by, like, Valve, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe in this alternate universe, there's still room for Valve to like make those kinds of games. Maybe this is the alternate universe there's where we get Half Life Three. Now they just don't. I think I think pretty much every game that went Sony would probably have ended up being a Sega game or vice versa. You know, there would have been a lot of stuff between those I two. I... Sega would have like pushed those games in a very different direction. Like I don't think they would be like, yeah, cool, let's have this game where you just like hold forward and have three characters talk at each other for 15 minutes they'd be like fucking put some points in there or something like like their games are weird and arcade like, they'd, they'd be called fucking... like talk em ups instead of walking <laughs> sims like you play like a fucking yakuza game and like it'll be like all like in it and then like you'll do like a driving section where it has like fucking big like glowing yellow reticles like going across the screen like a fucking um What's the virtual cop or whatever, and it's like yeah. suddenly out of nowhere, this like weird super arcadey shit. I think That's I think what I will say about on. the Yakuza games. For all their cinematic aspirations, they're super video gamey. 
And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's just that's how they're made. We, you know what? If Sega were still around as a console developer, we'd have more Echo the Dolphin games. Mm. Yeah. And a lot more. And a lot Wait, less Sonic games somehow. How's that's what's weird. Seeker, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Sorry, what is Sega? House of the Dead Seeker, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it yeah. is. There's the five of them. We, <laughs> one thing I think would be insane, though, is like. I think one of the things that would be interesting is I don't think. You know how Nintendo get a lot of slack like when they do shitty things like people are always very willing to forgive nintendo for shit Mm -hmm. like i think if you had another developer that had the same history like had been around as long as nintendo like sega that was still out and still on their a game they would be a lot more prepared to hold like just the general public would be like a lot more prepared to hold nintendo responsible for like bullshit yeah. Uh, just kind of like give them a cut. And also, I think one of the most insane things, Sonic at the moment has probably the most insanely fanatical fan base. Like, I don't understand how... Like, there is like Sonic fan game annual conventions. There's a fucking live action movie with Jim Carrey. There's comic books. There's TV... Like, Wait, wait, this, there's not a live-action movie coming out. That was just a fever dream of people's <laughs> minds. <laughs> Imagine that fan base, but if all the Sonic games were good. Like, like well, you know, it's, it's that kind of insane fan base, and 90% of the Sonic games suck. And I in a weird Sonic, way. Weird, you can, I think the fan base ex- is so fanatical because the games that's, suck. It, that's kind of where I'm at. Like, I think if you would have kept making Sonic games... I, for example, the the Beatles versus the Rolling Stones argument, right? Like the 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 argument about that is, well, the Beatles stopped making stuff. You can go look at Rolling Stone stuff, and it's not as good as wh- maybe where they started out. Would the Beatles have been that? You know, if they kind of kept making music. So I think you can kind of look at that with Sonic, where I think a lot of people may have this ideal mindset of if they kept making Sonic games, they'd all be like Sonic One, you know, on their consoles. They but keep making Sonic games, and they're really bad. Right. Right. Exactly. There's. That might have just been a well that they, you know, tapped out at that point. Who knows? So the other interesting thing about this alternate reality is that Sega acquired a bunch of franchises that were mostly PC based, like Company of Heroes, Total War, because they stopped, you know, being a console developer. Do you think they would have acquired those companies at all or that they've like we'd have like Total War but like console focused? Mm, I think I think they were really into that Total War series kind of maybe that was their their spot their sweet spot that they found because they were even making um like I think they made like a PC version of Risk for a while like they were making a lot of weird RTSs for a while right after they kind of got out of the console market um so I think that had to have been by choice I don't think that was an accident I just don't yeah, think it's I want to say the original Total War, the first one's from like 2000, 2001. It actually mm-hmm. goes back pretty far. Yeah. So that would have been right about when the Dreamcast was still kind of around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, but they didn't acquire the Total War franchise until 2005. Yeah, I, I, I just what I guess what I'm saying is I don't think they they stumbled into making RTS's game or RTS's period. I kind of feel like that's where they saw their spot and, and, and jumped for it, you know? Okay. Um, but I I don't know if they would have stuck with that. I just think that that was their their little. They saw an opening, right? Much. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to say about this alternate reality before I make a whooshing transition noise? Uh, Can we talk about another alternate reality. Reality I want to live in. Fucking damn it. <laughs> uh, well, we're stuck with this one. Um, sorry, I don't have anything more clever to say. Um. So, whoosh. Um, I like sorry. It. Whoosh. That is the sound effect we're getting for, for Halloween this year. Um, this is what I've always wondered about. And maybe this is a little too niche, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Speaking of console-based alternate realities, what if Xbox had made their big push with Brute Force instead of with Halo? Yeah. Okay, I-, now, I was literally just googling what the fuck brute force was at the beginning of this podcast so i could talk about this because hey Murph, what the fuck is brute force <laughs> i thought that was like i thought that was a like a well-known game that just never got sequels it sure as fuck isn't <laughs> i was like googling a video of it and it's like 
some third person shooter where you're in trees? It looks like fucking Jet Force Gemini, but like you're like realistic people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Well, I think that brute force was definitely more, what more traditionally what console shooters have been at that point, right? It looks very, and and it played very perfect dark kind of style, very generic. Yeah. You're shooting monsters, uh, you know, huge giant guns that made super big explosions. Uh, Halo was. It's it was a it's gamble. Different. Yeah, it, yeah. It was not something like at the time. I think it's really easy to act like Halo is just some kind of. Oh, of course it's super safe. It's Halo. But at the time, they were like almost like a, a Mac exclusive developer. There was a lot of weird it stuff to Halo. Like, like real time strategy game. Mm -hmm. That was so one I, of the fucking little things. I, and like, who the fuck bets the like console on a first person shooter at that era? Right. Like, at that yeah, point, especially mean, one that oh. was. Very very mechanically different from other first person shooters at the time like the two we, we talk about the two weapon limit like it's a totally normal thing halo pretty much invented that mm -hmm. halo invented that the regenerating health the i think is it the first dual stick shooter like first person shooter if not it's close i mean it has to be like, one of the top three if i had to guess like, wait did the gamecube come out around that time as well when did the gamecube come the out GameCube the predates the xbox from what i want to say Okay, so there's po possibly a GameCube shooter that would fit the bill. But yeah, uh, it's one of the first GameCube twin stick didn't have shooters on it. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Metroid Prime is crying her eyes out right now. Um, no, like it. That was the first person adventure game. God damn it! <laughs> you shot at things. It's a shooter. Um, <laughs> It doesn't matter. You, you scan more things with your visor than you shot, really. <laughs> That's fair. That is fair. Going back to the topic, if Brute Force had been the game that they pushed as the major thing, that Xbox would not be a console anymore. Because I'm watching these fucking videos and it looks dire. Yo, that game was fucking great. This was like, that was like the a team. game for the generation, honestly. That wasn't like a, uh, like, it wasn't a stinker. It just wasn't, it wasn't what it Halo became. Like it just looks like there's nothing to, like, grab onto about. Like, you say fucking, like, there's... Halo isn't a perfect game, but it is very visually distinctive. It's very colorful. Like, Master Chief is an instantly recognizable character. I'm looking at, like, fucking generic McBland dude in, like, a foggy fucking, like, absolute brown and gray forest. Like, it's just... It's just... There's nothing to latch on to as like a fan of this I'm, like even if it plays well it's just there's not anything really here that i could see like man i could see building this into a huge franchise it's like fucking... you could play as a as a wisecracking lizard well i, I think that lizard people look like really boring lizard people like do you know what the visuals remind me of like Turok, like N64 yeah, that's, Turok. That's exactly what this game existed in that world. Like, like I was saying, Perfect Dark earlier, but that's definitely kind of era that this game was trying to be. Uh, Did you have like a thirty foot draw distance before fog mysteriously appeared? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like literally, there is so much fog in this game. That was what's called doing the Turok comparison. I think I have a, I just have a soft spot for it because one of my friends had it, and when I was a teenager, I used to play it in his basement a lot. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't really awful. It was just understand that. Like one of my favorite 64 games was fucking Gex into the Gecko, but I'm not going to pretend that was ever like content for a great series. I, I think the thing about Microsoft getting just in general into the game space, I don't think they knew what to push. They had a lot of weird games that they just didn't really have a, a fit or a stuck genre. Um, like, remember, like, there was, like, what was it, Cameo? Was that one of their launch titles? That Cameo was kind of it. So... Was it? Yeah. Um, they I just... love Cameo. It's really underrated. There, if you go oh, back oh. and look at their launch lineup, yeah, though... Fuck, like, they had that, like, card-based RPG that recently got pre-released for Xbox One. Bats and Kytos? Uh, no, that was no it's, uh... uh... Oh, God. It's not Hand of Fate. It's, um... So it has a D in it. That's not very descriptive. Fuck. Sorry. Uh, Xbox card yeah, RPG. Really <laughs> uh, 
God damn it! You're this always, is... you're gonna get nothing but like Xbox One Phantom probably, because huh? that's what I'm so, doing. It was Phantom sorry, Dust. Phantom Dust. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. They also, I knew it had a D word in it. <laughs> got like a bunch of the Sega games. Like they got Shenmue Two. They got Jet Set, um, Radio Future. They had fucking Blinks, the Time Sweeper, which Bones would have a lot to say about if she was here. <laughs> oh yeah, she already wrote a whole article on it. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll dump they got, it in like, the link dump. Fable and shit, didn't they? Oh yeah, they had Fable. They got Psychonauts was an Xbox original game. They got like, yeah, their yeah. their launch lineup was dire. Um, it was not a good one. Dark Summit. Oh, it, Dead or Alive Three is actually a Xbox. decent fighting game. Yeah, they got all the EA stuff. Oddworld Munch's Odyssey is probably my least favorite. Project Gotham Racing was was solid. Shrek. Uh, They've always been really good at racing games. That's like one mm-hmm. thing I don't think Xbox get a lot of credit for. But like, they've always had a super like good racing lineup, which I don't think anyone else really has. I mean, I guess like fucking Mario Kart is the only. Yeah, game games in general in that early two thousands just were kind of all over the place. I don't I don't necessarily know what what this was their launch lineup was compared to everything else but this is not good stuff air force delta storm you can even pick that thing out of a lineup a lot of these look like games that like oh, that you could have just made up that title <laughs> i believe that was a video game um, um yeah yeah i i think microsoft got lucky in one way with bungie and halo and then another way i think they were smart to realize what they had and run with it because that in a way they not just Halo the game, but Halo like the play style, the lifestyle almost became Microsoft's gaming culture over time. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, like the fucking like if Halo didn't do the fucking Xbox Live shit, like that yeah. basically changed how video games work. Yeah, whenever I log into another console service that isn't Xbox Live, it always feels like I'm taking a step back. Even Steam lately, honestly. Um, but I, I really do miss that kind of infrastructure or, or that that. Now, Xbox Live has a lot of problems with the actual people on it, but the service itself, I've always thought, was was pretty universally great. Yeah. yeah. Xbox's gaming culture, though, has changed a lot, especially this gen. Mm-hmm. But that's, I think, not so much, um, not so much based on like the games they're putting on there. It's more based on like, um, sort of, l- kind of losing this console generation has changed the way they what like what they're thinking about in terms of what they want on their console well, they also and have, the kind of like, image they're cultivating i think it can't be understated they like changed who runs xbox like mm-hmm. yeah that's version. true don matrick I, i've said this like i've said this before don matrick sucks and phil spencer is much better yeah yeah like, going from don matrick to phil spencer is a fucking huge step up i so, think like, probably the the closest comparison i could maybe make if you're not really into following you know video game heads or whatever uh is like you know how marvel for a long time it was what's his name ike perlmutter and it was just yeah. like the marvel cinematic universe at the time which is kind of this weird jokey don't really know what to do with it kind of generic action flick and then you know you switch over from him and it's just like look at night and day difference between what marvel used to be and why Kevin people, Fage is it now in yeah yeah and, and why you couldn't why it felt like you could never make a successful superhero movie to now that's literally the only movies that come out you know um yeah well, literally but you get what i mean uh so I, I think that's that's kind of an interesting comparison and similar to what xbox is kind of has gone through where you've got a guy who just didn't understand gaming game spaces it's all about exclusivity and throwing money around and this and that versus i think what you're seeing now with xbox is we don't care where you play our games whether it's pc or or xbox or wherever but we're just gonna make yeah we're just switch to me was the big shocker i mean that's that's given away a little bit of a of a competitive advantage in a way but sure i don't think the overlap in audience between nintendo and xbox is a is a, is a circle like it is with sony so sure go for it yeah i mean that's that's also kind of ties into uh the next uh, question i wanted to ask which is the switch as this weird portable slash home console device um you know it's been a success i really like my switch uh but there was a while where people thought that the switch wouldn't happen because the wii u flopped so what if the switch hadn't happened what if nintendo decided to go third party after the wii u what would the gaming space look like then that would be a very different different thing because unlike sega which always had these kind of like third party games nintendo's only kept all its games in-house mm-hmm. if 
can't really sell out its, you know, licenses or work on other games other than, you know, its very few core games. I don't think it could sustain itself as a third party. I, I think it I think it could. I think I think you could probably make an argument that even just licensing Mario out to, you know, look at what uh, Ubisoft did with fucking the best. Mario, uh, oh. Yeah, I mean, okay. probably the best Mario game I've played in a while well, is that one. Fucking, yes. Um, what's the people that did fucking the Cadence of Hyrule? Like, they like same like, people who did uh, Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Yeah, the Necro Dancer. Like, they actually seem to be doing pretty good licensing out there, like licenses to other studios. Fucking Star Fox for um, the Ubisoft Starling. game. Oh, yeah. Starlink is so good. I, I can't say enough good stuff about it. I know it's going to be one of those underrated, nobody played it gems in a couple of years. You know what the best thing oh, yeah. is? By the it way, was... uh, the Cadence of Hyrule developer is called Brace Yourself Games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was never going to get oh, that. Oh, they're Canadian. So that's, huh. a pre- that's a pretty good track record if you just look at those three. The, the times that they've done well, it, I think yes, are... but you, no, no, that's not the only times they've done it. They tried doing it in the 90s and they got the Philips CDI. I remember, <laughs> that's right. uh, there yeah. are Zelda games made by a third party developer that nobody talks about. I totally forgot <laughs> about that. People talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> not in the way that they want to, though. They also, uh, fucking, I don't know who made them, but there was a whole lineup of, um, PC Mario Entertainment games that, oh, yeah, 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 Mario TG typing and stuff. Shit. My, oh, Mario is missing. There was that as well. That's my first Mario game. If you want to put something into perspective, is it? Um, who made Mario is missing? I thought that was, I thought that was first party because it's the really it's like kind of Luigi's good. Mansion, isn't it? Um, San Diego. No, it was made by the Software Tool Works, which is an American video game developer. How does it get like Broder Bound? It's to make everything. What? Sorry. It was developed by Software Toolworks and Radical Entertainment. Like the Radical Entertainment like only did the they did the NES port. Um, they but still did the, an the NES main port devo- of Mario is missing. <laughs> I was not expecting that from the prototype people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think I think they probably would have been, you know, still a company. I think Nintendo still would have existed. I, I I'm still one of those people. I enjoy the games I play on my Switch. But I wish I never would have bought a Switch. Just to be honest with you guys, it's just I don't know. I don't get the value from it that I I feel like I do for my other consoles. There's one or two releases a year that I look forward to and play, but past that, it's just been kind of it, it's not my go-to console for for pretty much Here's anything that's not with the Switch that I think would be lost if Nintendo would win third party. I love my Switch. I it, it, unlike Kappa, it's probably my go-to console. I think I own two first-party Nintendo games for it, though. It's basically, I use it as a successor to the Vita. Like, it's just a handheld game I play games sure, on. Sure, sure. Like, uh, that's all I use my Switch for. Um, so, and I, I'm in a... Space sorry, go ahead. This, and I was just saying, like, if Nintendo had gone third-party, that space for, like, indie games and everything wouldn't really exist. There'd be nowhere for them to be other than Steam and the shit where they... And just, Steam's... Kind of shit the bed, so... Yeah, like, indie games don't like Steam, but, like... Yeah, I think that would honestly be the thing I would miss the most if they'd gone third party. I love my indie games on the Switch. What I will say is I would miss the flexibility of kind of gaming on the go or wherever I really want to in my home. Um, and Nintendo's always been said... the master of that mobile gaming i mean from the original game boy on nobody's touched them in that mobile market (laughs) so honestly what i was doing with my switch is i was just playing it before going to bed i was just lying in bed and playing it um now i live in a studio apartment so my tv's like next to my bed and now it's useless um but like when i had a one-bedroom apartment it made a lot of sense so now i have no use for my switch as like a handheld console if they hadn't done Switch right, then there would be no one doing anything in that portable game market. Do you reckon we would have got a Vita 2? Yes. Yeah, definitely. I, I would say, I'm actually going to disagree and say no, because the Vita was such a, like... The Vita was dead before the Switch was yeah. even released. Yeah, the, the Vita v- was such a commercial disaster that I don't think... The it... Vita was a commercial disaster, but it's like, it would have been a very easy commercial disaster to fix. It's just Sony were fucking idiots and made you buy the fucking proprietary Sony Mini 
card memory bullshit that costs like three hundred dollars. Oh. The reason oh, yeah. I say yes is because that market in Japan is a market that no that someone is going to take care of. That yeah, like, like their their handheld gaming market makes ours look like. I a think joke we would have. I reckon we would have gotten like. We got a Vita <laughs> I reckon we would have gotten like yeah another kind oh, of three DS type Vita, Don't get me wrong. That that name was scorched earth, but um, I think there's definitely a handheld market would exist, and it, I think it would be a Japanese company that would take the lead. It just. It's just too much of a. I think that would have been Nintendo. The original one, Sega comes back to do fucking handheld. Another game gear. There you go. (laughs) Second, oh, Nokia N Gauge (laughs) Two. Yeah, Nvidia tried it with the Shield as well too. So I mean, there there's been companies who have tried it, but um, no, I I think that's too big of a market to to get away from. Yeah, I, I reckon it would just been Nintendo making like a 3DS2 and staying entirely out of the home console market. Um, yeah, I, I could definitely see that. Maybe Nintendo says, okay, we're done making home stuff, and then the Switch is really just a portable. 3DS3. Oh, yeah. 3DS. Oh, yeah, they made the XL new 3DS. Because uh... <laughs> they would have given some shitty name like that. It would have been like the new, new 3DS. <laughs> no, it would be the 3 3DS. <laughs> The 33DS. The the 3ET. Um, Sorry, I'm out of bad names now. Uh, So let's look at the flip side of this. What if the Wii U had actually been a Smash success? I think that's a more interesting uh, argument because I think the Wii was about as hot as I can't even wrap my head around this concept enough to even entertain the idea. it, It couldn't have been. It was fucking dude. The Wii was so huge. To the okay, so let's like... say they called the Wii U the Wii 2, like they should have, and people actually understood it was a different console, and then they actually bought okay, it. Okay, so first, the announcement trailer actually says there's a fucking console. Like, it is yeah. five minutes of, look at this controller, and like, hiding the console pushed away in the background. <laughs> Fuck me, that was a doomed console. Nintendo's okay, so let's say like Nintendo's the, marketing general. department had its head out of its ass at that point. Yeah, like that. Then what does the the the, the gaming space look like? Well, I think uh, it actually has a bigger effect on the Switch because I don't know if they basically go to the Switch. I think they try and keep a separate console and a separate handheld system, like a new new 3ds or whatever the hell they're going to call it. Yeah, it's 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 a question of do they take the right lesson or the wrong lesson, and I think I think gimmicks or not Nintendo's strong suit. I don't consider handheld being a gimmick like I do waggle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I think if the Wii U was a success, I wonder if they start to say, okay, people just really like these weird gimmicks. Let's keep running with these things. Um, I, I don't... That'd be interesting, because I, I think they could take and, definitely a good lesson or a, 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 the wrong lesson, and it, it I, would really weigh I a lot whether I like it I think the Wii U had as many gimmicks as the Wii did, it was basically just, can you use the the controller screen? Mm-hmm. So can you have this kind of dual screening gaming, what you're holding and what's on the screen? Oh, I don't think you played enough Wii U to explore the gimmicks, because that thing had some fucking gimmicks. You ever play, like, the um, five-player games that one person controls on the screen and everyone else controls on the TV? Yeah, yeah, I played a couple of those. I feel like, that's actually an interesting use of it, instead of... Oh, here's an in-game camera. Right. Oh, your inventory's in your lap. I, I, I think the asymmetric multiplayer actually is the cool use of it. I agree, I, yeah. Like, one of the biggest downfalls of the Wii U is, like, um, it had the thing where you were supposed to be able to play a game either on the TV or on the screen, which means you couldn't really use the screen for something important because you had to be able to play the game entirely just on the screen on the controller. So, like... Well, for some games, yeah. There were some games that actually did manage to use the screen that you were holding on the controller and the screen yeah, on the TV as like separate screens. Like, that's my like point. Zombie like, U. Like, there's which... Zombie U, there's like three sections in Wonderful 101 that do that. There's fucking Star Fox Alpha, which ruins the game. And... Tokyo Mirage sessions use both screens really well. <laughs> okay, but so... no one cares about that one. I, I think. Hey, yeah. hey, 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 hey! I think if they, but I, I pre-ordered that shit when they announced it was getting ported to Switch. I guess because I'm, I'm a fucking weeb, and I'm gonna probably buy it a second time despite having a Wii U with it. 
I, I just think that if the Wii U took off, it would be because stuff like that, instead of not working, worked, right? And then it becomes, okay, well, we, we knocked it out of the park with Waggle, and now we've got, you know, controller, in-controller screen stuff going on. So what what's... I, I don't know. I, I think that's what the direction they would have went in. Successful, do you think we would have got the heart rate monitor actually released? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> or as we have fucking dumb heart rate monitor games. And because it's Nintendo, oh my god, you know what they'd make? They'd make a fucking... Do you know, remember that game show, The Chair, hosted by John McEnroe? <laughs> they'd make a fucking Nintendo version of that. <laughs> hook you up to your heart rate? Make you <laughs> yeah, you, you're like, in a game show, you can't fucking stress out. And then, yo, they'd make The Chair 2. It'd be a video game. they get John McEnroe to host it. It'd be fucking great. <laughs> That sounds just I'm like yelling in an apartment with thin walls. Um, <laughs> this is a bad idea. Not at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm yelling like John McEnroe. Um, you throwing your uh, your mic around too? I wish I was. Uh, I, I'm anything. taking the tennis racket out of my closet and just like wailing it at shit right now. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, I think I think it would be interesting to see. Like Nintendo continuing the gimmick route, not 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 in the sense that I would like them to, because I really wouldn't. Um, but I think it would be kind of interesting intellectually to see them, to like what other weird shit will they cook up? I like in the in the universe where the Wii U is a smash success, the Ring Fit controller that's coming out for that Ring Fit game in a few days, that's like the controller for. The sequel to the Wii U. <laughs> oh god, it is, isn't it? <laughs> you um, know that it's only a small step to getting Rob, Rob back in some new form, because the NES had so many wonky ass controllers that failed, like Rob or the running mat for the track and fitness game, track and field game. We'd get a new power glove. That's what we would get, really. <laughs> I, I swear, like, the Nintendo console afterwards would have been, like, a DDR mat and a ring and then a crown that, like, connects to a heart rate monitor. <laughs> and that would have been just, like... I mean, it would have been cool, but... It wouldn't have been. <laughs> it would have been really <laughs> shitty. Speaking of which, I'm actually thinking of getting Ring Fit Adventure because it looks legitimately cool. My and I'm... Great, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a flabby piece of shit right now, so I just need to to get in shape and I'm not using my exercise bike these days. Um, that'll get me back into it. So that's kind of what happened, uh, what we think would happen sort of in the console space. Let's, let's switch gears. Talk about, talk about the PC space. What if Maxis still made sim games? Yeah. Or Maxis or sim games kind of continue to exist. Um, I, I yeah. Just, not just like sim city, but like sim copter right, and sim, sim health Ant. and all those other. Yeah. Oh yeah, some ant. Yeah, I remember that shit. Yeah. yeah. I, it, oh yeah. It was an exciting time to be playing those games because it was right at that weird time in my life where I thought edutainment games were dumb and you know shooting games were cool, and then Max's games really kind of turned me around to that being okay. This is actually pretty fun to be an ant or to be a this or to be a that, um, and. I don't know if that was like an of its time type thing because I don't know. I'm sure there's still edutainment games out there. Don't get me wrong, but um, they've kind of died. It's yeah. really weird. Have you seen that fucking like hyper action character action edutainment mass game someone's making? That no. looks rad as fuck. I... So it's like, do you guys remember Math Rescue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's kind of like that, but modern. No, cool. it's like um. Do you ever play, like, Dishwasher Samurai? I didn't know there was a game called Dishwasher Samurai, but keep going. <laughs> okay, basically imagine Devil May Cry, but it's like a 2D platformer, but, like, still that kind of combat. And then when you, like, get a character to, like, a stage where they're stunned, it, like, asks you a mass question, and you have to quickly put in the answer to do the fatality on them. Oh, so it's like Typing of the Dead, but with math instead of typing. Yes. It looks rad. <laughs> Yo, I want to play this. Let's, let's... On Twitter. I'll have to see if I can what happened to just number munchers? Come on. Number <laughs> munchers is just like fucking only doing math. You got to like add in the platforming and, and the finding this, the numbers and the correct sequence. You got to do it math rescue style, yo. You got to make it fun. Uh, math rescue is definitely the one I remember the most. I'm, I'm on board with this one, actually. 
I was I was the right age to actually grow up on Math Rescue. So my parents got that when I was a kid and I played that through a lot because I didn't have any other games. And my parents believed that any video game I played had to be educational. So in order to get them to get them to buy me SimCity 2000, I had to convince them that it would teach me something about urban planning. What really all I did was I had a teacher who used SimCity to teach us about urban planning in class. Cool. He also let us install Warcraft 2 and all the computers in the computer lab one day, so he may not have been the best example. <laughs> <laughs> there you I, go. I, I, I liked Maxis a lot as a company, but I think I don't know if... You know, we talk a lot about these companies that go out of business. I don't know how many of those are just that's just the way the market went or that's just the way the studio was managed or they got bought up by somebody super predatory who well, basically... Well, they by EA, weren't they? I think it depends. That's kind of what I'm getting at. I don't necessarily know if Maxis would have stuck around. I mean, that was a oh, very wait, kind no. of... Fuck, that last game was Spore, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, not fun. That was before the... Yeah, that was the last game they made before they got bought by EA. Then they made some SimCity and Sims games. And we can debate about how good those were. Right, because I guess what I'm kind of saying is if Maxis had just basically put out Spore, which was the hugest, most hyped... what Spore... When it came out, I can't. I don't know if there's something similar, but this game was going to change our lives. Is how it was sold, and then this was going to be the like this was going to be the end of video games. Right, exactly. All we were going to play for the rest of our lives was some variation of Spore. Um, and then so when that kind of flopped, that's typically what would happen. You know, a lot back then is that would pretty much cost you your studio. <laughs> you know, like it's like all right, nope, missed. Sorry, you're gone. So them getting bought out by ea was basically their version of going out of business i feel like because i don't know I, I, it doesn't make sense to me how why this happened but it definitely did happen all the time if you if you you were always one flop away from just not existing for a lot of these companies basically uh, it's still the case for a lot of companies mm-hmm. i'd say um so let's let's stick in the pc space and let's move on to the company we were discussing earlier i'm Blizzard sorry, Entertainment. sorry can we just there's a fucking game co- I never knew existed that was a sequel to Spore called Dark Spore, which yes. is like a dark, broody, evil action game with the Spore dudes? Yeah, it was kind of like what a fight, like fuck? a Diablo game. It was awful. Awful, 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 awful. I think they actually pulled it from the market. Like, it's one of those games like that you just can't buy anymore, because I think it was actually pulled from the market. Um, I don't know if that's a rights thing or a reflection on the game, but it was one of the worst games I've ever played. Um, really silly and goofy in, in all the wrong ways, too. There's also a uh, uh, puzzle the servers adventure were... of Dark Spore. <laughs> yeah, the servers are permanently shut down in, um, three years ago. So the game is no longer playable. Um, yeah, and with them shutting down the server- servers was met with a lot of criticism because now that piece of gaming history is gone for good. You cannot play Dark Spore in any way shape or form we're all we're all it the worst for it real bad. it was bad um so so yeah i mean i my, my thing is this i think there's a lot of companies you can look at and say okay things changed and they didn't and they would have went out of business regardless of what happened because of the market forces i think westwood's kind of in that that conversation too maxis i just don't know if the market moved away from them but i think there's a lot of other companies where you can look at and say oh yeah this, these guys definitely got bought out and ran into the ground by ea um like bioware yeah, Bioware is probably example number <laughs> number one right now off the top of my head. But there's, there's visceral, there's, yeah. If like the Sim games had kept going on, would we have gotten that whole like parody Sim genre, like Ghost Simulator and shit? Uh, I, I I think you got to look at what Will Wright, who was what he is, Maxis in my head, right? And yeah, I yeah, think, like Jima and fucking yeah. So when yeah. he was doing when he shifted interest. He was he was bored of SimCity, so he switched to The Sims, or like Spore was its own thing. So I think you would have been at that guy's whims no matter what. And I don't think he ever would have gotten into those parody type games. Now would other people maybe, but um, I think the reason so, it, it was so yeah. ripe for parody is because that guy was so serious about it. Like he looked at these games as being like, I think he's the closest thing we have to the, that guy in Ready Player One. Not in like the like I don't know, not in the bad ways. Like you know he was evil or anything, but. The, the the main no, the I'm guy who meant, like not the like 
they would have got into developing them. But I mean, like, the, those would that genre exist? Out, like, oh. after the sim games kind of stopped being a thing. Like, oh, I, that stopped existing, and then that's a parody of a different kind of thing, though. Like, that's a parody of games like Farming Simulator and American Truck Simulator. Oh um, yeah, it is too, isn't it? Yeah, fucking yeah. Ignore me. Yeah, so that's so. I think we still would have gotten those kinds of games, um, but I don't know. Maybe it'd be slightly different. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk. Let's stay in the picky. I can say words. Let's <laughs> stick in the PC space. Take the picky and <laughs> st- stick the picky. Uh, that's that's the that's the name of this podcast. Stick the picky. Um, <laughs> That's not going to make any sense to anyone. Uh, anyway, uh, what if Blizzard had hadn't canceled StarCraft Ghost? Uh, I have have I talked about here before that I played StarCraft Ghost. I got to have, or I had to have talked about that at some point. I think you might have mentioned it. Um, I don't know. We've done fifty four episodes of this, sure. so possibly. So StarCraft Ghost was so ambitious for its time um, that I think there was either a chance it was the flop that destroyed blizzard or it was uh, the fps that revolutionized gaming it could have been one or the other um it was asynchronous fighting well before that was really a big thing um it played a little bit like uh battlefield 2149 had a lot of game modes like that i think if i had to guess probably what led to it kind of not making it out was probably the story wasn't up to par because i really do believe blizzard at that time cared a lot about the story so I could see that not having been up to par and being the reason, but also because it really felt like a Warhammer game. And I don't know if they were worried about, like, this is kind of gone from, okay, this is Blizzard Space Marines, so this is just straight up Warhammer. Um, well, you had Tile Fire Warrior really said about the same time, and apparently Fire Warrior is a decent game. If they could make a decent Fire Warrior game, why not Ghost? <laughs> yeah, um, Ghost played really cool. I, I'm sure the cinematics and stuff are still out there, but uh, you were an on the ground, you know, um, you know, running it's around. Ghost. Yeah, yeah, so, doing. But you were down there with the Marines playing stuff. The the mode I played was basically like, um, there was like these mobile platforms that were like where you basically respawned, and so you had to like conquer the mobile platform, push your enemy off of it. You could play as the Terran or the Zerg. They both played completely differently. Um, a lot of stuff like that, but I mean, you could play as the different. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. I always thought it was just fucking. You played as like the ghost lady. Nah, they 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 had this all planned out. It was going to be kind of like the first time where you play like two different factions uh, in the versus mode. It wasn't going to be like a good Terran and a bad Terran. There's actually going to be like different factions and stuff. At least that's what they were saying at Blizzard. I went so. The BlizzCon I played this at was in 2005, and it was in Korea. I didn't play it in the United States. So uh, we might have played some weird, you know, version that was only tested or shown at the Korean markets. But this, I mean, this is really what I remember was that I was like, this is going to blow people's minds when they see this. Um, and it it was really shocking to hear, like, probably a year or two later, it was just completely vanished. Um, so I was really interested in seeing how that would work out. If I had to guess why it never saw the light of day, it was because CNC Renegade was right, was basically the same idea of a game and completely flopped and more or less destroyed okay. Westwood. Hey, Merv actually will try and defend a CNC Renegade when he gets back here. I, I liked it. Uh, I, it's, <laughs> I've played it recently, and I think there's a lot of stuff in there that modern games have kind of taken and run with that, whether it was technology or just kind of, you know, not a not really embracing the idea and going full out with it, but it was great to run around just in the CNC world in general. Um, and I, I enjoyed I enjoyed CNC Renegade. Whenever I play my uh, Command and Conquer replays, I always make sure to play that one weirdly. Um, and what I actually almost think affected Ghost is right before Ghost was done, it was like in the late 80s, they were working on a Warcraft adventure mm-hmm. game, the story which ended up being Thrall. canceled as well. Yep. And that I would... wonder if the failure of that game kind of made them skittish on ghost when they couldn't get ghost's story to come together right I could, I could definitely see that because that game well weirdly that game basically is what became world of warcraft right so, congratulations <laughs> you failed your way into a huge amount of success but uh yeah I, 
if you looked at that game, that game almost looks like a CDI type dungeon quest where like you were a thrall and you were making decisions and doing stuff like that. I think it was called like the Adventures of Thrall or something. They really didn't want it to be an in universe Warcraft thing, uh, for whatever reason. It's like a point and click adventure game, but like in that really like yeah. modern with time animation style and it didn't right. very yeah, awesome. remember... fucking age like milk. I remember at the time reading, like, a really long magazine article, like, with all the previews and screenshots from it. And the only thing I remember about it is that you play as an orc being raised by humans, which becomes part of the story in Warcraft 3. So they Mm -hmm. held on to it somewhat, but, yeah, the art style is um, almost like the island, actually. Exactly, yeah, that's a a good way to describe it. It it straight up becomes the story of, wow, you play as uh, Thrall, son of Duratan, raised in Duratar. What's up? Like, isn't it more Warcraft 3 than WoW? Uh, I mean, well, Warcraft 3 doesn't... Warcraft 3 didn't have a orc campaign. You yeah, only play as... No, you play as the founding of Orgrimmar. It's just a series of quests that they added in later. So that was in, um... The founding of Orgrimmar was the Frozen Throne orc campaign. Warcraft oh, yeah, 3 yeah, yeah. campaign, you started off on the eastern continent, you travel across, you fucking find... Like, you had a full campaign. I've yeah, you're right, you're right. Time. But... But what what ended up being the the orc campaign or from Fro- Throws of Pro was basically that whole part was was right from the Adventures of Thrall, like that whole like we're gonna cross this area, we're gonna be liberate from the humans, we're gonna do all that. That was what was gonna be the Adventures of Thrall, um, and then that founding of Orgrimmar is basically what you know what where you lead into with WoW. So yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think either way, you probably could make some some choices either way with WoW. But um, setting that up with Thrall having a, a story where it's interesting, and I don't know if people would have played through a point and click adventure though. Um, that, no. yeah, cause that was like ninety eight, ninety nine. Yeah, that was that was point click was dead. dead by then. Yeah, definitely. yeah, it was a time when the, the throne was dying. Awesome! Like I love Thrall's whole story and everything. That game was fucking. Bad. Yeah, yeah. I, and there's that, like a full long play of it on YouTube where you can just watch someone play through the entire thing, and like, not good. It, that it's that would not seeing the light of day. I don't think anybody has any questions about that. Starcraft goes. I have. I don't. I don't know if it was an ambition, if it was a marketplace thing, if they were guessing that people were sick of shooters incorrectly. I mean, there's there's a lot of reasons why I think. Oh those, yeah, the I, shooter I, genre I, just died on yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, I think there would have been a lot of cases for why Ghost should have come out, because at least it, would have, it was ambitious. But though, I mean, at the same time, it's easy to say that, but then Blizzard is, well, has always been so good about turning their failures into huge successes. I mean, their, their failed, you know, uh, MMO basically became Overwatch, which is obviously, yeah. you know, I, I think a lot of companies wish they would have a failure like Overwatch. Um, so, if you've had that kind of track record, you say, look, we can take stuff about this game and turn it into something, then maybe you're a little bit more confident and not feeling like you have to get something out the door. And it's also at a time when, like, because when did that get cancelled? That was, like, early 2000s, wasn't it? Yeah, like... I Ghost guess, like, got cancelled, like, 2012, I believe. Yeah, it was... Well, I, I mean, it was... officially cancelled in 2012. Fuck me. Yeah, it was official. I mean, it was officially cancelled, but it was probably dead. From no, no, 2014 was it was officially cancelled. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but it's been <laughs> dead for 20 years, probably, at that well, point, yeah. When that game kind of stopped, like, when, like, off the radar and everything, Blizzard had such a high reputation. Like, every single game they put out was, like, a 9 on 10, 10 on 10 kind of mm-hmm. thing. That, like, if they'd release it and, like, it was good, but it wasn't Blizzard good, I think that would have, like, hurt their reputation as a company. You mean like if they released yeah, Diablo, Diablo 3, 3 hadn't happened yet. Yeah. Yeah, like but like yeah, it was before Diablo 3, it was before anything. Like it was like they like Warcraft, Warcraft 2, like every game they released had like StarCraft and fucking Diablo, Diablo 2. Like even their fucking like rock and roll racing and like the Lost Vikings and everything were like known as like underrated classic kind of thing. Like every single game they'd made was such a high quality, such a high standard that I think if it had come out and it had been like, yeah, it's pretty good. Like, I think yeah. that would have damaged to the reputation of the company. Yeah, that's one of those few companies that at that time, if they were releasing like a 70 odd or a 7 out of 8 type game, it would have been like a downward projection for them. 
you know, um, I don't think you were getting that with most other companies. They would probably would have been fine with releasing something like that, you know. And really, actually, looking at how late Ghost was canceled, I'm actually wondering if StarCraft Two killed it because StarCraft Two incorporates a lot of Ghost story into it between yeah. Nova and then on the later part of the Void um, missions actually have Ghost missions there. So I wonder if they just basically got fed up and said, ah, we'll just make it in StarCraft itself rather than as a first person. Yeah, I would guess so too because um, don't uh, StarCraft Two in as part of the story has that whole there's kind of like a fraction of the ghosts who go good and a fraction who kind of go or stay rogue. Um, so that could definitely be where that story actually ended up going. But I, there's, I think... Well, there's DLC to the last, um, the Legacy of the Void uh, section that actually is like three or four Nova missions that are basically ghosts. <laughs> yeah. Um, and th- there's a lot of stuff with, I think his name's Tosh, the, which we'll call it. He's not a specter, not a ghost. They're kind of yeah, like the... the 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 minions equivalent and stuff like that i think i bet you a lot of that stuff got repurposed but uh i don't know i i don't i think blizzard couldn't have gone down at that time now i mean obviously with what we started the show with that's you know totally different but um at the time they basically could have done no wrong so i wonder if if they're looking at it different from you know hey look we're not going to put out a seven when we're we're doing nothing but tens right now um that'd be my guess of, of where it went Speaking of Blizzard further, uh, what if WoW had just, like, failed? That, I think <laughs> that's a really interesting conversation because I think it, it looked like for a second it was going to... I was actually a hardcore EverQuest player at the time. Has so... anyone watched... Well, probably not. Did anyone get, like, the collector's edition of Vanilla WoW? I have all the collector's editions up to Cataclysm behind me. I just had a look. So you have two. Yeah. Uh, no, I have um, uh, catacl- not, not Cataclysm. I have... Huh? Oh, no, Cataclysm isn't fucking... Yeah, Cataclysm's like the fifth or sixth. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, Did you actually watch the making of DVD on the mm-hmm. first one? Yeah. Because that DVD got made before Warcraft came out, and they're talking at length of, like, we don't know if this is going to work. We really hope it is, but, like, Man, I hope people like this game. We've put a lot of work into it. And, and there's a lot of stuff. So... If you think about this, how many games of that size or scope would be made where half the people don't see half the content? Right? I mean, like, literally, yeah. like, if, if you played Horde, you didn't see all that work that went into Alliance until way, way, way later when they opened some of that stuff up. But um, could you imagine, you know, working on entire zones that you know no Horde person is ever going to step in and being like, well, what do I care about, you know? But yeah, sure as shit, you know, they went back and they made sure all those zones worked and they had orc quest givers and stuff like that just in case you wanted to wander into them. So they, they made a lot of effort to the game pulling together. But I, as a as a hardcore at the time MMO player, everybody was worried, like, this is too kiddie. That was a real big thing that came up a lot with, wow, yeah, this is too right. kiddie. It, like, like it, it was a lot more cartoony than mm-hmm. their usual art style. Yeah, uh, and EverQuest at the time was, was more or less catering to the hardcore. Uh if you weren't in a top tier raid gear guild with, you know, a enforced world thing, um, people were really concerned about instancing because if I'm a badass MMO player, who's so good at this game, what I want to do is make it so that nobody else can catch up to me. Right. And if I can control a raid and you can't go in and do it, well, guess what? I get stronger, you get weaker. And then that just perpetuates itself. Right. And then yeah. at the time while I was like, screw all that, you know, most of our raids and strikes, or I call it strikes, I've been playing so much damn Destiny, but most of our raids and dungeons and stuff are going to be instance. In other words, you go into your thing, you do your thing, and it has no effect on what anybody else does. So a lot of the hardcore people <laughs> well, at the time. The plan. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, what was the thing? I think you could have two instances of Molten Core running before the server crashed. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, you would want to be one of the first two, but it didn't really. It, it would it would change the way people thought about MMOs at the time because it, in EverQuest the entire concept was I get myself better I, and I make you weaker and that's why like, raid guild you, kind of thing. yeah and I mean I was in a raid guild and wow we would kill bosses that no one needed just so no one else could kill it right like we'd have timers and we would wake people up at 4 a.m. to go kill a fucking king of the dwarfs in the middle of a town that nobody went to just in case some other guild wanted to do it um (laughs) and and so for those hardcore people right this was like well this kiddie cartoony game 
that's going to do, you know, it's going to make me weaker and I, I can't stop my enemies, you know, from getting stronger. It, it, it was, it made a lot of people like concerned and wow. Honestly, I think that is why it was successful. Cause like, yeah, it made those like hard of the hardest of the hardcore people. Like, uh, I don't want to play this, but like everyone else was like, Hey, this game might actually be fun for me. Right. Right. And, and I think what, wow succeeded on the on the backs of casual people and i don't mean casual as in like bad players i mean and or even people who just didn't play as much i think it was was on the people who couldn't put in the kind of hours that you had to put in for me and my friends playing wow like from vanilla then like we weren't fucking in raiding guilds or anything like that you just kind of like slowly wandering through having fun and like it would what i think makes it interesting is if wow fails you got two things that come out of it does Blizzard actually focus more on their their computer properties like Diablo and StarCraft? So do those later sequels come out the way they do? And then for both of our listeners who can remember the early part of the century here, um, there were a shit ton of MMOs that came out in the wake yeah, of WoW. All and all of them sucked. <laughs> yeah, I remember <laughs> the phrase wow killer was thrown around so much <laughs> like you would you would think that like it was literally the only game people played um, oh my god imagine if like kurt Schilling's fucking mmo had succeeded <laughs> like, it didn't even get out the door yeah i mean it didn't yeah but like then in a world where but you have wow doesn't like exist a there's, less one. Than... there's a sci-fi one that got released to absolute disastrous a client oh. yeah which one um, but <laughs> it wasn't just was fucking Dungeons and Dragons MMO. There was a Warhammer. Hey, I, I played the D and D MMO for like five years. It actually was decent. It had flaws. It was never going to yeah, kill WoW, the, but it was actually it was, fun. It was fucking the Star Wars one. There was you had a, was, old was Republic's fun. still going. Even, the... even people like Richard Garriott who were making stuff like Tabula Rasa and like all yeah, these people. Tabula were... Rasa was what I was thinking of. Yep. <laughs> and you had like Dark Age of Camelot. You had. Um, I mean, just all these games, The Matrix Online. Could you imagine that being a flop? I mean, right? And all these games, Anarchy Online, that was a real big one. Um, a lot of these oh, MMOs. Remember? Oh, God. APB? Oh, that was way later. But yeah, that was, I mean, there was so many. Yeah, that, that was a train wreck. There were so many games. Or a car wreck. You know what I mean. Canceled. When you were when you're not just making a popular game that's selling for sixty bucks to make a ton of money, but you're also selling people on it for fourteen bucks a month. I mean, that's that's every accountant for a video game company's you know like dream scenario, right? So I'm sure that's a huge oh, yeah. reason why recurrent user spending is the term. <laughs> I think and that's like, why. A bunch of Go ahead. games come, like there were like. Most of those games failed, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But there were ones that came out like on the heels of it that did actually succeed. And so like those like Guild Wars wouldn't be a thing. Like I doubt anyone would have made Guild Wars if WoW hadn't succeeded. And oh. like so that studio wouldn't exist. Like I, th- I think Guild Wars we might still have got because it was kind of falling in the EverQuest uh, line of thoughts. Okay. But Guild Wars and City of Heroes, I think, were a little more dry from EverQuest than WoW, but yeah, there's a lot of those games that were never City really made definitely that well. Was, yeah, definitely. See, City of Heroes definitely is an EQ-ish in that vein of, like, uh, sandboxy. Because I think what people started calling WoW, I think it's stuck around, is theme park versus sandbox when it comes to MMO, right? So WoW is, they, they call it the theme park because it's a lot of breadcrumbs to get you to go from here to there and do certain things and see certain events. And it's like going to a theme park. You know, you know you want to go on all the big rides. That's what WoW takes you to is all the big rides. You can go on all the little weird shows and stuff if you want, but no, nothing's holding your hand getting you there. Whereas when you would have a game like, I don't know, like City of Heroes is a good example. You could play most City of Heroes and never even go to lots of the places in there because the game never really took you there. Yeah, but City of Heroes was before WoW, wasn't it? No, nah, it was about it was it was after for sure, but it was it was in the same era, but it was April after. April two thousand and four. When was WoW? Yeah. Probably right about that time. Uh, Wikipedia can tell us. November two thousand four. Uh, so it was like a couple of months before WoW even. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm sure they were developed like concurrently, but. City of Heroes kind of... I don't... City of Heroes, when it launched, was, was in a really weird spot. I, by the time Villains came out, it was fixed a lot. But, um... I remember yeah. getting into 
game here is just because everyone's like, you need to play the character creator. Yeah, like, basically. That's Can't... like a selling point. The character creator sold the game for a lot of people. It was the Code Vein of 2004. <laughs> <laughs> now that's Black Desert Online. I don't know if you played Black Desert Online, but oh man, that that game has a character creator and a half right there. You can set in the angles of individual teeth if you want. That's how crazy it is. That feels excessive. Yeah. <laughs> um, the one I wanted to talk to uh, on the what if scenario um, is what if mobile gaming wouldn't have been dominated by the cash grab king simulators or uh, Candy Crush. Candy or, Crushes. Um, what are some of the other ones? Like, uh, um, I guess Farmville in a little bit was one of the early ones. Those social games. Those Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. yeah. Um, um, what else is, I don't know anything about mobile gaming other um, than Candy Crush. And it's Super like Hexagon, Clash, but that. Not Clash Clans? of Clans or Clash of Something, I think. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's probably all those Clash of Something clones. Yeah. There's probably like a Clash of Clouds and clash of clams i don't know <laughs> i guess the, one of the things that's kind of always disillusioned me about mobile games is even if i start one and i enjoy the first 20 30 minutes i know that eventually i'm gonna get to a point where i need to join a guild or add a bunch of friends or suck a bunch of people in order to get the w rewards or i need to start buying all these 99 cent packages to increase my energy level so i can keep playing and and stuff like that um and it's oh, made yeah. it's made it very hard for me even with mobile games i enjoy to stick with them because eventually the you know the the, the 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 game itself kind of becomes apparent and it's like okay what am i doing now okay like, i can play example, this game i'm playing um like i fucking love peggle mm -hmm. and i've been playing peggle blast on mobile and like it's a really really good version of peggle but then it gets like it will just throw levels at you every so often that are basically impossible unless you spend money to buy the power-ups mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like those like i fucking wish i could just pay them to like five bucks and have peggle on my phone without all this bullshit and that's where i was going with it I, I thought there was probably a time where the xbox arcade model might have won in mobile gaming right pay five six seven bucks for a game but you get the whole game you don't have to do all this other weird stuff you're not limited to you know only being able to play for three hours a day without recharging your energy or whatever other dumb system they come up with you know three hours that's generous i know i um and i think so, this really derives from when um the gaming got big on the phones is because when you look at the fact that smartphones are all of a decade old is like 11 years old they've developed a lot in that time frame so when the games were first coming out on them you could only do stuff like candy crush which they wanted to make money off of you couldn't have put more complicated games like some of the board games that you can get basically mobile versions of now. If mm -hmm. you could have got those games earlier, it could have fed into a market of, well, we can put full games on there for five or ten bucks and well, you sell money about, that way. Like some of the games I mean, that used to be free on like, like I keep saying Xbox Arcade, but you guys know what I mean. The Like the, the hexic, like Windows Solitaire. Right, exactly. Those types of, like those games of the world that have always just been kind of arcadey free whatever games um yeah I, like you could put like a bunch of pinball tables on a, on a smartphone and that would be like it's something that people might be willing to pay for you know what actually works really really well on smartphones and we kind of like briefly touched on it before diablo style game they mm -hmm. fucking work amazingly on smartphones like yeah because it's like a one button thing you just tap instead of pressing the left mouse button and and, and that's why it's been disillusioned that we can come up with all these good examples and all these fun ways and fun things we could be playing on mobile right now. But instead what we get is like, I was actually playing a game that was kind of like Reseteer um, online. I was having a good time with it. And then I, and it was like, Hey, for 99 cents, you can, you know what I mean? And then it started with the energy. Oh, but your energy is low. If, if you, and then just like sours the entire yeah. experience. Cause now you're thinking about the transactions. Now someone's trying to screw you out of money and it just makes the, the whole experience feel like kind of cheap. Yeah, well, if and, you're playing Wreck to Tear, that actually seems very fitting. But uh... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, or it could be like like that Nintendo game where you have to like bargain for microtransactions. Oh, with the um, dog. Yeah. yeah, Rusty's real deal. And, and then what it does? The other thing it does is it then makes you decide. Okay, well, do you want to? 
spend 99 cents or do you want to suck in three people to come full you know what i mean like become your friends and you know it, it's all just very predatory feeling I, I i don't think i've ever stuck with a mobile game longer than maybe like three or four days that i i didn't just straight up buy you know what i mean that wasn't a free-to-play one i've bought a couple games like um i think there's a, a company i think they're called kairosoft kairosoft uh K A. I R O. Kairosoft, yeah. yeah. They make a lot of just kind of like uh, game dev tycoon type games, and you can usually buy them for like four or five bucks, but you get the whole game. There's nothing in there that they're yeah. keeping back from me. And those are the kind of games I tend to buy because I'm like, okay, even if I don't like it, I spend five bucks and at least I got to experience the whole thing. I don't feel like they're going to try to sneak another ten bucks out of me somewhere down the line. Um, so I, those that's usually like one of the mobile companies I actually look for when I you know, see who's out there making new games. But I, and it's I think- just... I think it's getting a little better recently because, yeah, five years ago, everybody was trying to copy King. Now mm-hmm. there's a few more games which are letting you buy them outright. I think the only yeah. mobile game I really have stuck with is Fire Emblem Heroes, which seems to actively discourage you from spending money. Mm-hmm. But that's about the only example in this sea of sea of free-to-play mess. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's cause feeding it's into the console it's games with the free-to-play like loot boxes. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting you mentioned Kairosoft because, like, Japan's gone all in on the gacha mobile nonsense. Um, and it's, well, it's like a big thing there. Japan loves their gacha just in general. They've always loved that. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. But where this gets interesting, and maybe this is getting a little too weeby, is, like, there are a lot of anime properties now that are just, like, based off smartphone games. Oh, wow. And if, like mobile gaming in that way with with like the like the predator mobile gaming hadn't taken off then there would be just like a bunch of anime franchises that don't exist what is grand blue fantasy now it started as a mobile game but there is the anime series there is a fighting game coming out by the guilty gear people there is a fucking rpg with the combat design by fucking platinum studios coming out there is like like, okay that was just like a gacha fucking game fucking Japan yeah. will find an excuse to make an anime of anything. <laughs> if they didn't make it of mobile <laughs> games, they would find an yeah. excuse of something okay. else. Okay, they made they had like this fucking mobile game with like um, waifus that are like ships. It's called Kantai Collection, and they had a fucking anime out of that. <laughs> they had a fucking anime with waifu like, like frigates and dreadnoughts yeah well it's basically a sequel to strike witches so come on it's not that much of a stretch isn't kantai collection like the biggest game in the world or something like it's a fucking disgusting success yeah a tabletop rpg game a playstation vita game an anime television series an animated film light novel like fucking um to be specific, sorry, World War II warships personified as teenage girls and young adult women. Yeah. Like I said, it's Strike Which is the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, and I say this, like, full well watching a lot of ridiculous anime. Keijo? And loving it. Like, like Keijo. But, but I'm reading the description of Contact Collection. I'm like, is there anything you fucking won't turn into a waifu? Like... <laughs> Well, like, remember, y- y'all remember fucking like Tide Pod Chan? Isn't there was, do you remember Tide Pod Chan? Game where you played as the personification of the video game consoles. <laughs> yeah, wasn't there one where you play like like cutesy uh, Hitler, like Hitler in like school or something like that? Yeah. Or is it like, or is it like World War Two tanks and like you play like a like a German tank? I think it was what it is. It's like girls in tanks. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, girls in Panzer. Yeah, yeah. I was like, uh, Why do I know this? I was like, this is kind of a, a weird line to cross, I think. I don't know if I'll be girls and... Yeah, for a second I thought we were talking about uh, Saga of Tanya the Evil, where yeah, you also sort of about. plays... But that, that that's a, just an original anime series. Or, or no, it's based off light novels. I don't know. But it's not uh, a mobile game. And yeah. yeah. It will be, eventually. <laughs> there will be a Saga of Tanya the Evil or Jojo Senki uh, mobile game. Um... Yeah, so that would be that would be really interesting. I think uh, a couple more questions uh, before we call this to a close. One uh, scenario I want to ponder is um, what if the 
like you guys all know Fortnite and mm-hmm. the Battle Royale mode really took off I have and done was that super game popular. Occasionally, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, what if the base building was what became popular, the save the world mode instead oh, of man. the Battle Royale mode? I wish it did. So the... I, I, I really liked it. Fortnite then. I, I really like the base building mode. I, I think a lot of people who haven't experienced it probably wouldn't understand what makes it fun because when you describe it, it's like it's one of those games where like describing the core loop or whatever doesn't sound fun. Um, but you know, you have the the map starts up. You have a couple minutes to go run around, scavenge stuff, get your supplies, do whatever you're going to do, uh, and then start building around an objective that you know they're going to be coming and swarming in a couple minutes. And it's like developing traps and mazes and stuff like that it, it felt really fun at the time it basically um, so, like like a really expanded version of just horde mode from gears of war mm-hmm. right like, so would like horde, would everybody be making like horde mode clones like fort building clones I, I, that would be seen? i gotta I think so that much that many battle royale clones like there's a couple out there but like there's the fucking um the titanfall one there's Apex Legends, yeah. There's the player of Unknown Battleground, obviously. There was a fucking failed one in the 80s. Look like and... a, a fantasy one. Like, I can't remember what it's called. Like, oh, that one was. Paladins one, yeah. Paladins did a. Huh. Um... It's telling that we can't name any of them, despite the fact that they showed off, like, four Battle yeah. Royales <laughs> at the PC Gaming Show this year. Uh, there was one called Darwin Project for a while that looked kind of cool. You were like an escape prisoner, a little more card- Battle Royale. Card- that's just like um, like deathmatch. Yeah, of- like a deathmatch arena. But I think they, I think they kind of tried to when they were originally advertising. I think they tried to make that a little bit fuzzy. But it's definitely a deathmatch arena type game. Yeah, because it's like only five people or something. Um, mm-hmm. There is one that's oh, it's like an indie one that's all like Dark Souls melee based in a city that like a vertical based city that's flooding. It that looks really cool. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's not actually that many. Like, it feels like there, there are a lot. It's wrong. just a lot of them have failed. Yeah, they're starting. To oh, by the way, out. correction: Contact Collection is not a mobile game; it's a web browser game. Oh, anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the problem with making too many player unknown on pub clones is the fact that it is very similar to death matches. So when you get the difference between you know. Just deathmatch, like you know, Team Fortress versus everybody is a free for all. Like if you're doing Quake old school mm-hmm. or Goldeneye, where everybody would be free for all, just because there's a lot of people, does that make it unique? <laughs> I, I think what what I've noticed for most people who get into battle royales, the what's what's weird is what actually makes them fun is just surviving but what makes them boring is when you die and it's like a 20 minute you know back to server browser and everything else so i think one of the things fortnite does smart is it gets you right back into the game fast yeah where a lot of the other ones are just kind of like okay well you died so now go do this um apex kind of copied that of course because they're they're catching up to where the leader was but um what i've seen from a lot of the the PUBG style ones like the older like more serious military ones because they're more serious they they seem to really like that whole idea of like okay well it's really a big deal that you died whereas fortnite's like who cares you know you explode in a puff of um, yeah fairy dust now go get back on the bus um yeah so i i i I, i've been through i'm old enough that i've been through a lot of these trends right i remember the moba trend i remember the mmo trend i remember the uh twitch based you know quake trend there's been so many of them that i don't hate battle royales i guess as much as most people seem to do i can recognize that they're not for me they're a a style of game i don't enjoy i'm glad they exist though but i would have loved for what fortnite save the world felt like a whole new genre to me like a whole new this is going to be like a new type of game that people are going to make and run with and play and i can't wait to see you know how this save the world clones yeah 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 i can't wait that's what i was thinking i would have i would have loved that if that had been the success story out of out of fortnite but uh, what ended up happening, what ended up killing Save the World even is so V Bucks were V Bucks. You used to get V Bucks for straight up playing, right? I don't, you still might, I don't know. But the problem with it was you could get a lot of those V Bucks in Save the World mode. So you would get people, and most of the Save the World stuff was like, you know, play five matches or whatever. So you get people who would play and literally just stand there because they didn't give a shit if you, you know, stopped the zombie horde or did this or that. They were just there to play their five matches, get their V Bucks, and go buy skins for the Battle Royale, you know? Um, and yeah. it got, 
real big problems, though, is the fucking Battle Royale is free. Save the World <laughs> wasn't. Like, yeah. <laughs> 30 bucks for Save the World. Um, yeah. yeah. Fucking, I play that. Most of the people I know who, like, if I see someone online who's like, oh, you have uh, Save the World, can I get it? Because it has unique uh, Battle Pass things, you know, for for the the Battle Royale mode. I'm like, man, I didn't buy this for that, you know, but whatever. Um, I, I don't I don't begrudge Epic their success. I, I'm glad for them. Um, they're actually a local game dev company, which is one of like three. So, uh, But I, I think that they probably could have managed what happened to Save the World a little bit better and probably walked out of Fortnite with two hit games instead of one. But it seems yeah. like the demand for uh, Battle Royale was just so strong. I bet you it was really hard to walk away from that and take a chance it's on something. Completely transformed the developer. Mm-hmm. If the the stories are to be believed, it's caused them to go into perpetual crunch mode while they keep well, turning out content for Fortnite. They can't hire they enough fuck, people. Save the world was going to be like fucking. We're going to release this game and then we're quitting game development basically. And it's like engines, yeah. Yeah, they were just yeah. going to focus on being an engine developer and like not make games anymore, and then. Fortnite kind of accidentally became the biggest thing in the world. Like, mm-hmm. they kind of like, yeah, well, we're just going to retire. We don't need to fuck. So I, I, I live in Raleigh, which is near where Epic is, and I've actually done one, uh, a user experience testing thing for them. And uh, if you look at, like, the job postings on – they probably use 10 different services or whatever for it. But if you look at the job postings, it's like they literally can't hire enough people. Like, every day that you go on there, it's just – you can just scroll down, and it's just all these epic jobs that they're trying to hire for, um, you know, to just to fill the job. And it's not necessarily this area doesn't have enough people. It's just that enough people don't exist, really, you know, for what they're trying to do, which is – start steam you build up Fortnite. you know they're trying to do like 10 different things all at once and it's one of those things where it's just like okay well how do we find this many whatever is to do it because it, it's there's just too many things they got too many projects out right now trying to figure it all out so uh it's hard to to do that to to get everybody um to to like staff up when something that drastic happens well, and even like um Right now, creative mode is actually really popular in Fortnite. Uh, it's all, it's like kind of their answer to Minecraft, um, you know, where you can just go build whole worlds, um, you know, and kids are, are, are releasing them and your map can get featured on Fortnite. And, you know, your favorite streamer might play your weird map. So um, for, uh, creative mode is now getting popular. Uh, I, a lot of my ki- when my kid used to be playing a lot of Minecraft, now all his friends come over and they play Fortnite creative and build kind of the same stuff they would build in Minecraft. Um, so it, it's weird to see that Fortnite's basically become this like content generator for for kids in a way um, that I'm sure Epic is extremely happy, but also extremely nervous about because yeah, where do you go from here when you're already this big, right? Yeah, I don't know, I'm man. Really down. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense in a way because when you're the game of you know the millennium right now, I I, I don't know. I I don't. I, I just see. I know a lot of people who just like ah oh, Fortnite, Fortnite, and uh, yeah, it's like it's a game for kids, but that's okay. We used to play games for kids too when we were kids, so um, I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I just think that the, some of the clones, some of the way that Epic has been managed, has been just kind of silly. But I, I wish Save the World would have been the hit that I, I thought it could have been. Yeah. Um, before we move on to our final question, another update on Kantai Collection. <laughs> uh, Kantai Watch. Go to the... The... <laughs> yeah that that that's that's our new our new segment um the pseudonym that the artist uses is i shit you not at least 21 <laughs> uh, <cool>. yeah <laughs> how nice of him to go for 21 and not even 18 he's giving ah, himself the three-year buffer <laughs> Super legal. <laughs> that just means they can drink yeah. in the U.S. Yeah, that's you know it's funny that those types of games are kind of catching on. I guess it's 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 always been time for that stuff, but um, it, it is interesting to see this kind of adult market because I remember like even like not just like curiously, I was like asking a while back, I was like, whatever happened? Because there was this weird stretch in kind of the late '90s where there was a lot of adult games, you know. 
Um, and then that just kind of died out. And I was like, there's probably like an underground or something. But it's weird that now like that stuff started to be po- become popular on, on different like Steam and stuff. Like every time I go on Steam, the top 10 sellers are just almost all visual novels. So uh, it's kind of interesting to see that I guess it's finally caught back on. And uh, that's the direction things are going to go. So. so I should emphasize Contact Collection is not a porn game. Um, it just has cute girls in varying states of dress. Um, but yeah, porn games have become a thing on Steam again. Well, they weren't allowed uh, on Steam until just recently, weren't mm-hmm. they? Yeah. I yeah. think that's kind of Yeah, like well, there was... Were... Okay. So they were sort of allowed, and then it's they weren't, and then they were allowed again. Like, whatever the fuck we decide today. Like, they still yeah. Yeah. Steam sometimes just because fuck you. Like the, the, like, the one they delisted in order to make room for another one was so confusing because it was like i can't remember exactly what the two games were i don't know you could look it up but like they delisted one that was looked like kind of like actually like the game we're talking about like just kind of like a cute girls doing whatever and then they allowed one that was just like straight up nudity um so i was kind of surprised but you know steam Uh, being steam they have no rules exactly Uh, i think that i mean okay they have let me let me just do my big steam (laughs) eh, rant right now Steam's rule is that they'll allow anything that's not like illegal or straight up trolling. Yeah. That is their official rule. But you know that that's not a rule they're going to adhere to. Like this is not some uh like this is not some ACLU-esque commitment to free expression. Like if they if somebody makes a Nazi game and it becomes a high enough profile game on Steam it's going to get taken down. We know they're going to take it down. They're not committed to like, oh no, we we believe in free expression so you can keep up this Nazi game. Which means that if they're going to remove the high profile Nazi games, they should probably not sell any Nazi games, including the little shitty ones that they're still profiting off of. So, yeah, that's what pisses me off about their current, this current status quo. Like, shit that shouldn't be on there is allowed to like fester on there and and become like trading card spam or whatever the fuck that was exactly what i was gonna say but like and like hateful shit is allowed to stay on there as long as it's low enough profile but the second you you get to a certain level then the publicity the bad publicity will be bad enough that they're not going to keep you on there and no amount of appealing to free expression is going to keep you on there so it's just a bullshit commitment to free expression that they're so my talking question to this both is, sides does Steam actually, like, validate the games that are submitted for first, or uh, they just basically <laughs> let people submit and upload games? I believe the they, the um, official line is that they check that it won't give your computer viruses. Which they don't. But, yeah. <laughs> ones have got on that do that already. There was one that fucking got on, and it was just a fucking Bitcoin miner. <laughs> Well, the, the other there was that, one game that got on that didn't have an exe yeah so that was what, one thing that yeah. i think that you made a great point that's really true too um is that they're allowing games to not really even be games right now you there's a lot of ga- things on steam that are really just okay well you buy this and then it unlocks this this like emote you can use in chat or it, this is like a basically 10 free trading cards because our game for whatever reason slipped through steams this is how you, you're allowed to make trading cards or not um, so now you can have this and, and get these trading cards. I think there was like a Trump game not too long ago, and it was like all the only reason people bought it was because you got this really, you know, trolly emoji, right? Um, and sure as shit, games sold like crazy. And so they basically made people rich who were pretty much just releasing a, a piece of shit game, but they were doing it in a way that kind of like Steam let go because who knows? I, it makes Steam right, it makes yeah. Steam money. They're making money off shit. Yeah. And, I, and like I, I'm, I'm not saying this because I'm like, you know, some Epic fanboy or whatever. I give Epic, I give Steam shit, I give all companies shit. But this is something I've been giving Steam shit about for a long time, and they've shown only like token fixes. Like they've tried to cut down a little bit on trading card spam, but they could do a lot more. Right. And I just choose not to because I have this fucking. Really lazy, laissez-faire attitude to their platform. 
Yep, and I, I agree. I think we've talked a lot about what the drawbacks are on Steam because um, Steam. Uh, so, Destiny recently moved over to Steam, and a lot of my friends were ecstatic. And I was like, eh, I don't know. I actually like Battle.net a lot. Um, and then like Steam started having all these problems. Steam goes down three or four times a day for different server reasons. And then when you're playing, you it get updated. Yeah, yeah. It's always updating. Every time I turn it on, it's updating. You know. Um, so while I was telling my friends, you know, like that's not annoying until you until you're mid raid. You know, until you're about to, you know, kill the final boss, and then all of a sudden that gets really annoying. Destiny's servers are actually going through Steam now. Yes, yeah. So Oh, it's not just fucking... Oh, no. So they're using Steam? They've transferred to Steamworks? Absolutely. And and even little things. So, like... um, That's not good. The way it used to work with Battle.net, right, is if I was your friend on Blizzard, I could check your clan status, I could see what you're doing, where you're playing, where you are. So they try to bring that over to Steam, except Steam doesn't really do that. So in order to do it, you have to become Steam friends with people, which sounds okay, right? But Destiny is a lot of drop-in, drop-out multiplayer, right? So if I want to play with Nemrex, you know, uh, and and see what he's doing, I have to friend him on Steam, and then I have to look on Steam, not in-game, which over time gets really, really, really annoying, you know? Um, I hope you have two monitors. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, that, and that's what it's become. It's become, okay, well, I have to have one monitor up to see what my friends are doing and one monitor up for the game. So it's little things like that. When you switch a game over to Steamworks, I think a lot of, you know, there's fanboys of everything. I think there are people who are legit Steam fanboys and just think that Steam's the greatest for everything. And I think even most of the games that people like on Steam don't use Steam for for their hosting or their servers or whatever. I don't know if, about how that really works, but... Uh, I mean, I will say Steamworks is kind of a one-size-fits-all yep. solution. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, a lot of what attracted developers to put their games on Steam was having all this machinery just available to them out of the box and very easy to use with a really simple API. Sure. Like, that's that's been part of Steam's success, and I give them all the credit for that. But it does mean that if you've developed your own uh, system and now you're trying to shove it onto Steam's, you're going to run into problems. And that's, that's the, exactly the best way to describe kind of what's going on with Destiny right now. When you had it all set up, I'm sure Destiny is its own thing because obviously huge game moves servers or moves moves different hostess. Um, I'm sure there's different I- issues for whatever reason, but it, it really sucks in practice for the average player because all the systems that work now kind of just don't. They, I mean, they, they're there. They just don't work the way they should. Honestly, Destiny sounds like it's got it easy. If you had Heroes of Might and Magic 7, you had to be running Steam and you play at the same time. <laughs> I remember that, actually. Um, oh, yeah. They had that That's weird, like, a... dynasty mode where, like, you I can't, like you would unlock things and it unlocked for your family almost or whatever. That, that was in it. 6. But oh, yeah. We're, we're going to avoid talking about Heroes 6, or 5 and 6 too much because I... Um, I fucking hate those games. Yeah. Well, the Dynasty <laughs> was really annoying because I would unlock stuff and, like, it would save it on Steam, but not vice versa. Or, like, I'd unlock it on Uplate, it wouldn't show in Steam. So right. I was constantly unlocking stuff and it, like, never showing up. It was so frustrating because those Dynasty things were really important because if you wanted to play with a different character, that's how you the kind game of carried could it for. keep track of what campaigns you had beat. Because yeah, you had to exactly. campaigns to unlock later ones and you could never know what you had actually done. It was, oh, man, it drove me nuts. That sounds like a train wreck. It, it was oh, bad. Oh, Hero was, 6, I could go on for a long time about how much of a train wreck that game was. Fuck you, soft. We'll, <laughs> we'll do that on the next podcast episode, which will be called Fuck You, Heroes of Might and Magic 6. Um... One last question that I think might be a really uh, stupid what if to ponder, but I'm just going to throw it out there, which is what if modern video games were based on analog computing instead of digital computing? Like an abacus? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry? Like, I don't understand the difference between analog computing and digital computing to even, like, as it gets at this age. Like, like, we're running punch cards on everything? <laughs> <laughs> no, that would still be digital. So analog is, like... So digital is, like, ones and zeros, switches on and off. Analog's, like, dials. So you can, like, continuously adjust so things would every instead game of just switches like, on uh, and off. Talk and no one explodes. Like, <laughs> like, all your friends would be sitting in the room, like... They sit at, like, the... the the dial bench i sit at the turn in the wheel bench or i don't know 
I, this is probably a stupid question. I, I, I lost screwed. all of us, Murph. <laughs> I, think this I thought it was fun to contemplate. I thought we'd have a nice discussion about physics and shit. This is one of those things that, like, like Merv gets, but, like, nobody else does. But, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what... I understand. This is fun. Everyone else is like... Uh, <laughs> do I plug it in? What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a watch. Are you trying to, like, pop it? Like... <laughs> <laughs> what if Bop It were like what if they made like a triple A version of Bop It with like DLC <laughs> <laughs> um, in this DLC the, the It bops you um, yeah, sniff it sn- <laughs> sniff it uh, speaking of things that some people might want to sniff more information on Conti Collection <laughs> um <laughs> I gotta buy this game now. I, I mean, I feel like I know about it. Um, so, these perfo- the description is that these personified warships are based on real life vessels, which are explained in detail within the game. The physical characteristics, appearances, and personalities of each of the girls correlate, correlate in some way with a real life vessel. For example, ships with a larger displacement tonnage are usually depicted as young women, whereas smaller ships look and behave like pubescent girls. Hey. I'm with a few out. exceptions. <laughs> Never mind. 21, right? <laughs> At least 21. <laughs> I know everyone, this is like, I've got guidelines for what games I will and won't play. If in any description of the game the word pubescent appears, I'm out. I'm just going, there's more video games for you to play. It's a descriptor that doesn't need to be in any video game. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I want that to be like I, an I internet mean, rule, you know, like when they talk about like, uh, you know, like they're like if you talk for ten minutes, Hitler is going to come up. I want to be like if you if you, pubescent comes up in the description of your game, it's not a game you should play. <laughs> yeah, the, the the weird thing. Oh God, we shouldn't be talking about this. There are going to be content warnings all over this podcast. The thing about putting pubescent in a game description is that it almost implies a more adult right, game. Right. <laughs> But it also is kind of like, look, they're old-ish, you know. <laughs> like, like I don't, like, I don't, I don't get the whole like she's a thousand years old, but she looks twelve. Right. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Like that. I, I don't like that. And I, I have no like. Okay. Let me put it this way: no judgment if that's what you're into. I just don't want to experience that myself. Yeah. It, um, it, it's hard for me to sit down and relax to enjoy that, but yeah, this is this yeah. is kind of a thing, I guess. I'm gonna have to grow up wondering if my kids playing a warship hot girl simulator. <laughs> well, I you can tell them that combat is largely automated, oh, so they can just good. I don't have to worry about the be. violence; just the, everything else. Yeah. Um. I actually don't know what the gameplay is. It just says combat is largely. You said it's a browser automated. game. It's a browser game. It's. I don't know what the genre is beyond that. Um. Sorry, the genre according to Wikipedia is fleet raising simulation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm slightly familiar with it broadly. I think it's kind of a a generic it's like idol project, like aliens or something, but. They're fighting aliens. And they're fighting some like weird third party thing. It's it's. The, not... Why are they World War Two warships? How do those help them fight aliens? Is it? Is how is that? Is, how is that supposed to work? Is there like a weird like nationalist angle to this too? This looks like when I'm looking at this stuff. There's a, there's a chance. I think the main point is ships are girls. Mm, okay. It, again, it's like Strike Witches, where the main point is girls are fighter planes, like the Messerschmitt or. Zero. <laughs> huh. Um, it's are like a less friendly kimono friends, where girls are in. I don't understand. <laughs> it makes I me want don't. to play uh, like a ship combat game, but yeah, everything else about that's kind of weird. Or, oh, do you guys remember that that warships game that was that had that like smooth voice oh, yeah. narrator uh, in the trailer leviathans or something like that hey yeah leviathan warships you be playing a video game right now why not make it leviathan <laughs> yeah i love that that's that's some good advertising yeah, you good don't one. need waifus to sell that shit to me so i almost bought that too that, that fucking trailer almost got yeah me. it was just a guy smooth talking over like a, a ship combat game i that, i remember that 
I think it, I think it was like an advertisement. People couldn't stop talking about how simple and effective it was. It was kind of funny. Yeah. So, um, I mean, speaking of advertisers, I think this has basically been the most free advertising that Con Call yeah. has gotten on a Western video game podcast. <laughs> so, you're welcome, Katakawa Games. Go ahead and uh, me. send me some girl ships or whatever yeah, these things are called. Send me some hot I loot. Like Katakawa. <laughs> yeah, it's made by Katakawa. We were going to say something about that, Ben? They're, Sorry? they're a book publisher normally. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but they have a games division, right? I don't know. They're a huge book publisher. So they they had a game... have a games division, but... <laughs> they do have a games, they have a games division to the extent that I believe a couple of E3s, E3s ago, they had a non-live stream E3 press conference that was, like, like press attended. I know them mainly because um, um, they're, like, an anime studio. They're, like, the people that make, like, Overlord and, like, that funny girl senpai and all that shit. They made that fucking... Um, what's that one where they go to the South Pole that you were obsessed with? Um, Yorimoi, uh, a place further than the universe. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. like Katakawa. Oh, good to know. Um, yeah, at least they did. Like- they went on a ship. They, that ship was not a girl. <laughs> um, it was just a regular icebreaker. Um, yeah, this is this is a this is a capital P problematic <laughs> episode of the podcast. Also, a very um, weavish episode of the pod podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Kappa. Oh, this whatever, is what man. happens. You get me oh, and a talk man. to we'll, we'll, together. Strike witches. We'll we'll talk some Tom Clancy. The, 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 the fucking thing that Mike was talking about the entire time. <laughs> Yeah, we, okay, man. You're catching up with the rest of us now. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, at least you read the agenda this time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, on that note, since apparently nobody knows what the difference between analog and digital is, um, <laughs> I got it, man. It took me a while. Hand. One of the clips has numbers on it. Merv wants to play Bop It for the rest of his life. I got it. <laughs> I think Merv wants to go play Contai Collection right now, so we better let him go. I, I, will, I will play Contai Collection, but only if it's analog. Yeah, yeah. He's going to have to, like, build a ship in his backyard or something. Turn, That's not what it means. Turn, turn, it, to the, turn it to the stern. Or God, guys. There's going to be, like, so listening to this podcast, like, these fucking idiots. <laughs> um, I mean, isn't that every episode? <laughs> Yeah, it's usually my fault. This is a nice change of pace. <laughs> um, so if you'd like to keep up to date with the podcast, you can follow us on our website at avocadogamescast.wordpress.com where we post each episode. We post a link dump that tries to fact check what we say, but we are perfect, so sorry. Um, you can also subscribe to us on iTunes or Google Play Music. Just search for <laughs> Avocado Gamescast. And if you want to check out the community where we all congregate and you want to hear more of our thoughts on Kantai Collection, then uh, please check out The Avocado at the-avocado.org. Uh, it's a great, wonderful, inclusive community of gamers, non-gamers, and people who like to talk about Heathcliff, <laughs> which is an orange cat that is Are you in trying comics. to sell it or not? I can't tell. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to sell people on the website, but uh, do read Heathcliff and do play Conti Collection. If that, you take nothing else and, away uh, from this podcast, and, and play your games chemically. I mean, I, I think that's we can all agree that's the most important. <laughs> chemical, right? Is that the next chemical step? games? <laughs> Yo, they make they make urinal controllers now. <laughs> and you like P and two? You know. Yeah, they're called toilets, but with like a Y instead of an I. I'm not making this up. This is a thing that exists. <laughs> I don't know enough not to question you. The link dump is going to be so interesting for the show. Yeah. I like that it's going to end with a toilet. That's, that's the best part. <laughs> yeah, because this episode ended up in the shitter. <laughs> um, just like all Halloweens do. Um, this is like the least scary Halloween episode we've done. We've usually done horror games in the past, though, but I don't. I kind of run out of horror games. Sometimes we talk about Resident Evil, you know? Make more horror um, games, so we got more to talk about. We talk about Pathologic. We could talk about the evil within. We could talk about this, like podcast with like man, listen to this idea for a white head podcast. That we 
I was gonna I was gonna segue to say we could have talked about Ghostwire Tokyo, but now we can't talk about it because you could be Nakamura left uh whatever the name of that studio was that Thank she you. used to work for. Sorry? Tango. Tango. Tango Gameworks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now who the hell knows what's gonna happen to that game? Maybe maybe more Bop It DLC. We'll get lucky. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um Yeah, so uh if you wanna play Bop It, go play Bop It. <laughs> If you want to play The Evil Within, go play The Evil Within. Um, and if you want to play Kantai Collection, please destroy your browser history <laughs> after you do it. All right. Uh, later, folks. Later. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for listening. And we will see you next time. We will still be older than 21. <laughs>